Good morning. Good morning. We will call this work session to order. Thank you for being here this morning. And public comment, uh, clerk, do we have public com comment? Yes, ma'am. We have three individuals signed Okay. We respect our citizens' rights to address this government in this meeting. However, I intend to enforce our three-minute rule in order for this meeting to run smoothly. And once you've uh, reached your three minutes, I will ask you to wrap your sentence up. And uh, we'll go from there. And then. Um, please avoid campaigning or personal attacks against personnel or officials which should be handled in another forum other than a business meeting of this body. First person on the list is Don Re uh, Leonard. How are you, Don, again? And if you could, if you could state your address and uh, your subject matter, please. Okay, I'm going to do a little first Good amendment. Morning. My name is Don Ray Leonard. I live in Creekside Subdivision in District 2. Commissioner Robinson, after your public admonishment of me at the last work center or work session, I will respond in kind. Let me be clear. This is not about the buses. It is the process by which you govern that is the main issue here. On April 2nd, you accused me of playing politics and diminishing my neighbor's First Amendment rights. Let me remind you that I have stood at this podium before speaking on the First Amendment. I'm extremely offended that you would even hint at the fact that I would not respect a citizen's right to free speech. At no time did I minimize or invalidate anyone's concerns or their speech. Shame on you for the mere suggestion that I don't want their voices to be heard. Now, who was it that called the sheriff to come down and tell us we needed a permit to peacefully assemble in front of our own courthouse and to leave the premises? Who was it that layered Citizens Hall with security during our town hall meeting? Who was it that had Mrs. Camp removed from our town hall meeting for asking a question? And when there was public outcry in opposition to the placement of the new senior center, our new chairwoman declared, I will not be choked by the public. So please do not lecture me on infringing on a citizen's First Amendment rights. Check yourselves. Now let's talk about my neighbors across the tracks. I run those streets north of the tracks every single week, leading a caravan of trucks with my brothers and sisters in Christ, bringing food, clothing, and supplies to some very depressed neighborhoods. We talk to them, we pray with them, and we have nothing but love for them. Our north routes include Huey, Camp, Simpson, Chicago, and Warren. I listen intently to what these people have to say and I know what's going on over there. The suggestion that I feel I'm better than my neighbors and do not respect their rights is utter nonsense. Don't tell me that I'm not a good neighbor. Don't treat them as pawns to fit your agenda. And you are quite right, Commissioner. They are not stupid. More importantly, do not spin this as a racial, social, or economic issue. The suggestion that the problems here or anything other than lack of transparency, bad process, and fair representation by this governing body is disingenuous, and it affects everyone in this county. So, Commissioner Kelly, you can stop the political gamesmanship <coughs> and, excuse me, and refrain from lecturing this district to constituent on the First Amendment. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh Don Ray Leonard for coming today and we appreciate you participating in uh, county government and we'll take your concern under advisement. Next we have Mr. Larry Pierce. Mr. Larry, Larry Pierce, would you please come forward and give us your address and your subject matter this morning, please. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. After all this time, you mean y'all don't know my address. But anyway, Larry <laughs> Pierce, 4120 Van Sant Road, Douglasville, Georgia. <clears throat> Believe it or not, Madam Chair got a new hairdo. Yes. And when I go to the barber, you know what they ask me? They <laughs> charge me $12 for a beard cut, and they charge me a finder's fee <laughs> for a haircut. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, that's what she said last week, and I, I like to fell out of the chair. I thought that was funny. <laughs> All right. I've been quiet okay. for the past couple months about certain things. But a couple days ago, <clears throat> I got a phone call. And this person said, Larry, 
I want you to call somebody. Her name is Tony Caldwell. She's right over there. I'm going to introduce you to her. I asked her to come up here. She has never been up to the courthouse. She's been in Douglas County all her life, went to Douglas County High School. And she thinks some of her relatives are the Pound family. And I said, there's no doubt in my mind everybody's related because he had 14 of them. So I'm going to take a real quick minute. Her grandson was born <coughs> with micro something. Thank you. Basically, it's the frontal lobe of the brain. Gone. From the time the child was born, the <coughs> doctor said, Doug, well, I won't live too long. Mm -hmm. And probably could die at any time. Fortunately for the family, he lived to seven years old. He died August 14th. And he weighed 25 pounds. Now what I am up here about is what I found out how she was treated. The law says here, and I've been pounding about the law. Because you know, judges like to go by the law. Attorneys like to go by the law. Citizens don't go by the law. They do what's in their heart. Now, it says here after birth, before the age of seven, if the death is unexplained or unexpected, this child is expected to die. Day one. But they went out there to the hospital, died at home, August 14th. And Wayne Rogers went out there, got paid $175, thank you. And Willie Watkins came, took the body over there. They embalmed him. Now I like to fell out of my tree, and I would put a word in front of that, that I'm gonna respect. And when I say I fell out of my tree, because after the embalmment, and after the GBI lab says, no, we don't need to see that child. They went over there and took the child anyway. After embalmment, and went to the GBI lab. And Willie Watkins called her and said, I'm not sure if we're going to have the viewing on Thursday, but we'll have it on Friday. And I got nothing else to say. So she's never been up here before. I'm not sure what she's going to say. I only met her downstairs an hour ago, but I did talk to her three or four times. So try to understand where she's coming from. Would you come up here, please? Thank you so much, Mr. Pierce. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. My name is Tony Caldwell. I reside at 3460 John Roberts Drive, Philadelphia. <coughs> On August the 14th, 8.30 in the morning, I get a call that my grandson passed away at some point through the night. Now we knew when he was born that he could live a year because he has microcephaly, holocephaly, he have two more cephalies. No frontal lobe, no temporal lobe. So it was established from the beginning, he's probably going to pass away from it. But he lived to be almost eight actually. He's been eight, three months later. So once I get a call, I rush to Douglas Wellstar. So when I get there, he's already pronounced deceased. Um, the coroner was there and he asked me some questions about the baby while I was a cast on his leg. I said, well, he has what's called hypertone. And uh, it's because without all of your brain, you seize or you flex a lot. So, I mean, he would flex really bad the way his hips turned backwards and his feet and his hands. So the doctor was putting cast to try to correct slowly. I said, you can do x-rays, his bones are not broken, whatever you need to do. It's been established he'll pass away from this eventually. Y'all bear with me because this is my baby right here. So he said, I'm going to call DFACS to see if there's any <coughs> open child abuse cases. If not, we'll release the baby to who? I said, with what? About an hour later, DFACS called said, no open cases, not a fake, none at all. 
So he contacted Willie Watkins. They made it clear this child will be embalmed immediately. He's been out nine hours. They take the baby. This on a Monday. Embalm my grandbaby. And um, like I said, it's fresh. Seven months or something. And I just lost my brother. So my baby brother. But um, they get him to Willie Watkins. They embalm him. We get a call actually on a Thursday. Mind you, the view is Friday that the GBI wants the baby. And I'm like, why? He's been a bum. What are you going to find? He has no blood. The body's been washed. Who dropped the ball? This is what I want to know. And when I call the coroner's office, uh, Miss Renee Gartman, I mean, I don't know the lady. I don't even know what she looked like. She was rude to me. I said, I just want to know what the findings was or cause of death on my grandbabies. Mm -hmm. Complications due to microcephaly. I said, ma'am, his complications was why he was alive due to microcephaly. He could not walk, talk, turn over, sit up, eat solid foods. That was his complication. What was the reason for his death? Was it a seizure, heart attack? Was he suffocated? You know what I'm saying? Nothing. Just rude to me, you know. So I, I just go ahead and get off the phone and I called Greg and really, why do you know? I said, what went wrong? He said, Miss Tony, I'm about to keep this baby, but I can't override the state. GBI with the baby for whatever reason. I said, but what do they hope to find? I mean, so we go to the viewing on Friday, they rush him back. They get him on a Thursday, rush him back a Thursday evening. Actually, Friday morning. We walk in, and what they done to my grandbaby? <coughs> Y'all excuse me. It, it just didn't even look like it. And you know, I gotta walk up and look at my grandbaby with his head being cut open. Willie Watkins couldn't fix it. You know, then he gotta figure out how to keep this embalming fluid from leaking because he already had embalmed the baby and they done cut him up. So in my mind, were you curious about this microcephaly, holocephaly, and his other two cephaly? Were you just curious? You could have did an x-ray. You would have saw no broken bones, whatever. We did what we could for almost eight years for this child. It was very hard. Mm -hmm. Cry 24 hours a day sometime, and we tried to figure out what is hurting him. What you know, it, it was hard. And I know the Lord saw fit to come and get my grandbaby. You, you know what I'm saying. But the way that lady talked to me at that on that phone, I never got a call. Why did this happen to my grandbaby? Why was he not having autopsy? You know, taken to the GBI from that hospital, like they took my brother two weeks ago, straight from there to the GBI where he was there nine days. Why didn't they take this baby? His complications was why he was alive. So you can't tell me he died due to complications. What were they? Nothing. You know, then you're telling me my grandbaby weighed 33 pounds at almost 80. No, he weighed 25. You're weighing him bombing food. He could not gain weight because he couldn't do anything but lay it. So, you know, I'm just saying, I called again. The lady hate for me, so I just stopped calling. You know, because I can't get a real reason why. Did he suffer a grandma's seizure? It was show. You know, his tongue would have been chewed up or something. But to tell me he died due to comfort, then why did you even bother cutting him up? We knew he would die from that. That was established. So I don't, I don't need to hear you tell me the complications due to his Cephalies. I needed you to tell me he suffered a stroke, heart attack, or both, because it was possible. Um, we knew he had had three seizures in his whole life when we rushed him to the hospital by ambulance. So, I mean, and then when I called to see what's going on with my brother, you know, you're being hateful to me. And I said, ma'am, look, you chose this profession. Nobody made you take this profession. But for you to be hateful to people because you're tired or whatever you're going through in that office, you know, that has nothing to do with the public. We rely on y'all for answers. Mm -hmm. You know, you won't even tell me if my brother's body is back after nine days. You won't even call the GBI to see him. Nothing. You know, so everything we planned for him got put off because of your actions. You know, we done set up memorial, everything. And then we couldn't even have a student because then y'all decide nine days in, he has to be cremated. So, you know, it's just been a rough year for me, but mostly over my baby, because I took care of this baby, you know, and uh, it's been hard for me.
And I, I promise that I would cry, but until you deal with a special needs child, you don't know how wonderful they can be. And they can't do anything. So when you see one milestone, they said he wouldn't do nothing. He started laughing at three years old. So we assume the angel was playing with him. You know, but that was about it. Or he started kicking his leg. So that's a milestone and it, and it gives you joy. And then for you to walk in and see your, your child just cut up. Well, they couldn't even, he didn't even look like my grandbaby. So, and then for you to treat me bad on the phone, I knew when I needed me going up there, you know, because it was just going to be worse. So I, I called one more time and that was it. You know, so, and with Watkins, he did call us. And he said, I just, but I haven't received one phone call from him at all about this mishap and how did it happen. I mean, who makes that call? when it's established that a child is gonna die, same as if you're under hospice, like my mom. Once it's established, they pronounce her death. Yes. And it was established with our money from day one. And then you let us go through this heartache, you know? And then we walk in this funeral home and it don't even look like it. You couldn't even fix his head. And Willie Watkins does wonderful work. Yes. But he couldn't do nothing with it, you know? And he's in the corner looking at me with his head down, you know, cause I walked in and shot. You know, but that's all I have to say. It's just, how many more families gotta go through this before they get it together over there? What I'll do is uh, I will we'll follow up for you and I'll get back with you personally um, okay. regarding your concern to see what the process was with GBI and the purpose because of the states have statutes and they require. I'm um, under the assumption the GBI wanted, but they didn't see where it was warranted and then almost four days in, I don't know who made the call that, you see what I'm saying? So it's hard for, as he says, civilians to get somewhere, to get information. You know, other than, you know, organizations they can get, it's hard for us. I just want to know what really happened to my grandchild. I'll follow up with you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, thank you so much for coming in. <coughs> That's how well. We appreciate you. Uh, you're speaking and I will get back with you personally. I'll follow up on this. Okay, I think we don't we don't have anyone else who signed up. So next, let's go to presentations. We have two presentations today, and first we have our SPLOS update. Uh, Mr. Mitch Bolain, see if we switch you to the podium. Thank you so much. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the Board of Commissioners. I'm Rich Bolain. I'm with Moreland Alpha Valley and Associates. I'm here to update the SPLOSH program, uh, 2016 SPLOSH. First of all, Happy New Year. I don't know if you all realize it, but uh, March 31st was the end of SPLOSH year one, and April 1st was the beginning of SPLOSH year two. So what I'd like to do first is Jessica put together a PowerPoint presentation. It's only about two minutes long, and it basically uh, it's kind of like a recap of everything we did in the first 12 months of SPLOSH. Is it working? Basically, it's a recap. I'll, I'll try not to talk too much through it. But, uh, just go back to the basics of uh, what the one percent was supposed to do. Fire EMS, if you remember, is thirty-two percent of of the overall program. All of these things in red are projects that were worked on, completed, in the process of working on, purchases. Uh, did a lot of work for uh, Chief Spencer during the first year. <coughs> and we appreciate it. Transportation, 51%, if you remember. Uh, we did the resurfacing program, uh, paid a bunch of streets. We purchased a bunch of equipment for uh, Miguel and his crew. Uh, we're starting on design for a lot of intersections and roads, and uh, 
sidewalks, some of them are in construction, so we'll talk about that later, but uh, uh, 51%, Miguel's got the bulk of the money, so uh, we're trying to uh, get that. Parks and Rec, 17%, some of the things that we work for, carry some equipment, and work on some light renovations and relocations and things of that nature, so we'll uh, What you'll see in my presentation is, is exactly that. Through the first 12 months, we expended $8.1 million. So those are invoices actually paid. So uh, and just some pictures of some of the things that we've been working on and some of the things that we've done. Program management. We've gone to a number of meetings. September, Saturdays, we were there. A uh, bunch of community meetings explaining the squash program, telling everybody what we do and, and where the money's going. And then some of the upcoming activities we'll be working on and uh, visibility throughout the community. You'll see us at some of these events. recap of what we've done the first year and now we'll go into the, uh, the status through the end of March fire EMS and uh, parks and rec uh, transportation we still have large buckets of money that haven't been uh, allocated to projects but we're working on that next slide this is just fire EMS showing how the spend plan matching the but uh, the actual expenditures matching the budget next transportation same thing uh, a little bit behind on the transportation program and then parks and rec is next same thing. And next slide. Skip that. Okay. Revenues. Uh, we're always a month behind on revenues. So what you'll see is through the end of splash year number one, we spent about $8.1 million. We still have not received our March revenues from the state. We'll get that <coughs> next month. But you can see through February, February we collected $1.76 million for uh, revenues. Uh, that was a little bit below estimate, but go to the next slide. And the next slide, that's just a board chart. Uh, through the 11 months, we've collected $21.3 million on, through the 11 months. Our estimate would be $21.9 million. So we're about $600,000 behind on sales tax collections. That equates to about $60,000 a month, just under 3% of what we were expecting. So we're running just slightly behind. Bond, uh, we have our bond obligations that we've got to pay back. We did make our April 1st bond payment that was due. That was $8.5 million. If you remember, we were holding that in uh, escrow so that we could make that payment. So we're, we're finished with our first bond payments for the first year. So net, no, go back. So moving into splash year number two, you can see there's splash year number one, 9.9. .9. But splash year number two, our first payment, payback to the bonding company, is October 1st, 2018. 
So this fall, we'll make our first payment. That's $1.3 million. That's basically just interest. Then our second payment for splash year number two would be almost a year from now, April 1st, 2019. That's a $16 million payment, $16.3 million. So for splash year number two, you can see the top of the green line uh, for splash year number two, our bond payback is $17.669 million. So collecting just under $2 million a month, it's going to take us roughly nine months of taking the sales tax revenues, putting them in escrow, holding them in our back pocket in order for us to meet our bond obligations. So starting in April, when we start collecting the money, I saw Jennifer before, but we'll, there, there you go. We'll start putting that money in the bank and just holding it in escrow so that we can meet our bond obligations. But we completed the first year and we are in year number two. So moving on with that, let's go into the projects. First up is fire and EMS. First project is the new digital radio system. Uh, Motorola is actively working on the new uh, digital radio system. We're working on three things right now. Site selection, finalizing the site selection backup generators to maintain power to those sites, and then the towers themselves. So uh, Motorola is actively working on that. Uh, ambulance, the ambulance is here 2017. We've got two more ambulances we're going to order uh, for 2018. We doubled the budget, and we'll get, we, I think we're going to piggyback on the existing procurement and buy the exact same thing that we did last year, just buy two units of that. Uh, the pumper truck is next. The pumper truck actually was delivered to Douglas County, uh, but it was sent back. There were still some things wrong with it. The punch list was not complete to our satisfaction. So it went back to Winder. They completed those items. Is it back now? Yes, sir. All right. So we've got the pumper truck here. Uh, this is one of the ones I was trying to invoice in the first splash year, but uh, that'll be invoiced in year number two. So the pumper truck is here, and you'll get that into service as soon as possible. <coughs> Next is the ladder truck. The ladder truck, you all saw that at the last board meeting. The ladder truck's here. It's in operation. And we've got about $100,000 of equipment to outfit the truck. So uh, we still need to purchase that and get the, the ladder truck uh, outfitted with the necessary equipment. Uh, okay, skip the. We also have some staff vehicles for 2018 for the fire department. So we'll get those. Station three renovations. We do have the revised plans. If you remember that we got bids on that, that was uh, slightly over budget, or greatly over budget. We have revised the plans. We value engineered some things out of it. There's some work that the county is going to do with their own forces. So we are finalizing those plans and we're getting ready to put that back out on the street for construction bid. So uh, station three will uh, hit the street shortly. Uh, Fire station signage, there's actually an agenda item today about a, uh, a change order to add one sign, but the, the station signage is just about all done except for that last, that one final sign. And that is it for fire EMS. Moving on to transportation, first up is the resurfacing program. We completed the resurfacing program for 2017 slightly under budget, so we, uh, we did realize a little bit of cost savings there. 2018, we have the list of streets. Uh, it went through the Transportation Committee, and now we're getting ready to put a bid package out on the street to uh, get construction bids for the resurfacing program for 2018. Uh, that budget is the $3 million, so we're moving forward with that. Moving into the economic development work, Riverside Parkway streetlights. I drove through there this morning. Uh, they are Coming from 92, they're just on the other side of Sweetwater Creek moving towards Thornton Road. We had a number of conversations last week. We've spoken to Greystone Bower. They're going to double up the amount of crews out there to hurry up and get that done. Uh, we we're, we're expecting completion at the end of March. I'm, from my experience, I'm looking it's probably the end of May now, probably towards Memorial Day. We should have that done. Uh, there's still some uh, poles need to go up, still some conduit, and they are actively working on it. A little bit behind schedule. Uh, next up is the Lee Road Extension Planning Study. That's ongoing, so uh, no, no real update there. And then Riverside Parkway, Rockhouse Road Traffic Signal. Again, I went through there this morning. Uh, 
The signal heads are up. They're not powered up yet. There is an application for power in, so as soon as we get electricity out there, we'll get those uh, signal heads flashing and we'll start the 30-day burn-in. There's still some permanent striping that needs to be done, the crosswalks hitting all four corners. That it's laid out, but it's not, uh, not done in thermal plastic. So uh, the traffic signal, as soon as we get that power turned on, uh, we'll start the 30-day burn-in. Uh, moving to intersections and operations. First up, Stewart Mill Road, Reynolds Road. Uh, we have an agreement with Jacobs Engineering. Uh, it's my understanding DOT is working on a contract to uh, execute with Jacobs, and then as soon as we get that contract executed, we'll get a kickoff meeting, get them started, and get them finishing up the design for Stewart Mill at Reynolds Road. Bright Star, John West Road is the next intersection. Southeast Engineering is working on that. Uh, we expect, uh, Terry's been working with them, we expect preliminary plans, which about a 10, 15 percent level of effort uh, later this month. So we'll have our first set of drawings and our first construction estimate for, uh, for that intersection later this, this month. Sweetwater Church, Doris Road, we talked to Paulding County this morning. They are just about done with their design. They, they've been minimizing the right-of-way takes with the turning lanes. Uh, they promised Terry and I this morning they will email you the latest and greatest set of drawings uh, later this afternoon. So uh, if you don't get those this afternoon, just let us know. But they've redesigned it, minimized the right-of-way take so that uh, we can get that job moving forward. Once we get those drawings, then uh, uh, your shop's going to do the electric the, uh, signal design for that intersection. So uh, again, we expect those drawings this afternoon. Chapel Hill Road intersections, same thing, Southeast Engineering, uh, they're 10, 15 percent done, expecting the preliminary drawings later this month with our first construction estimate uh, for that project. And then the two new projects for Splash Year number two, Highway 5 and Douglas, Douglas Boulevard and Highway 92 and Anawake Road, uh, we're working with Miguel developing a scope of work that we can move those jobs forward also. Moving down the list, uh, the, th the three schools, the sidewalk, Lithia Springs, Chestnut Log, New Manchester. If you remember, we put that back out on the street for design services. We sent out a number of emails to folks. Uh, those proposals are due back this Friday. So uh, we've been pounding the pavement, running telephones, and, and calling everybody we know to get people to respond to this. So uh, we fully expect a handful of proposals this Friday. Moving down the list, transportation equipment purchases for 2017. I think we still have two pickup trucks on back order, uh, so we're awaiting delivery on for that. And then 2018, we'll get started with uh, another 400,000 of equipment purchases for Miguel in uh, uh, transportation, and that takes care of the 51% transportation part. Moving to Gary's Parks and Recreation, uh, first pro project: Boundary Waters Restroom Concession Stands. Uh, we have the final plans. They're in review, uh, and <coughs> we're waiting. The architect is going to give us, I call it an architectural board. It'll have some of the materials and colors and everything on it. It's about a three by four uh, that you normally know, put on an easel, and it'll show all the details and the color palette and everything like that. So we're waiting on that. But we do have final plans, and uh, we're pretty happy with those. So we'll get that moving forward this spring. Uh, along with the soccer field lighting. So uh, again, we're marrying up those two projects, get both done with, within the original budget. So that's Boundary Waters. Uh, Deer Lick Park Tennis Court resurfacing and lighting. We received, we put that back out on the street for bid after we made a bunch of phone calls. We received two proposals, and you'll actually see in your agenda today the award to, from the, uh, <coughs> recommending the award to the architect engineer for the uh, design <laughs> services for that. So uh, I'm not gonna steal. Mr. Pico, is that not on? The other one? I'm sorry. Uh, we do have proposals. You should, it'll be moving forward. We do have the recommendation, and uh, it'll probably be on the next board calendar. But we do have recommendation for award to an A and E, and uh, it was it was a pretty obvious choice. So that'll be moving forward. Uh, the multi-purpose rec center uh, that was awarded last month to Sutton Architecture. Uh, we're still awaiting the executed contract. I know Bill's been working with Sutton, going back and forth, trying to get the signed documents. As soon as we get the contract executed, we'll get the <coughs> kickoff meeting and we'll get into the design phase of, of the rec center. 
senior center. This is the one that's later in the agenda today. I'm not going to steal this thunder, but the evaluation committee reviewed all the proposals, uh, came up with a recommendation, and they'll be asking your approval to uh, enter into a contract with the architecture firm uh, later on in the agenda. Uh, next up is parks and renovation and development, two parks, Bill Arp and Fair Play. Uh, the bathroom concessions press box. Uh, we have concept plans. Uh, preliminary plans that we're reviewing right now so uh, we have some drawings for that and uh, we'll be getting a cost estimate from them based on their drawings. Uh, Lawson, Lawson Associates working on the dugouts and the plan and the fence and you got preliminary plans on that also. So those two projects are moving forward. I think Post Oak Park is also in here. Uh, no activity on Post Oak Park, Post Road Park, I'm sorry. And then Equipment purchases, 2017, we still got one pickup truck on back order uh, with uh, Parks and Rec, and then we'll be moving into 2018 equipment purchases, and there's a, a couple of items on the agenda later today that gets billed to that 2018 budget for uh, Parks and Rec. And then last is the uh, program management expenses. Uh, we had our first work order. We carried it all the way through the end of March. Uh, we missed it by about ten thousand dollars, but uh, we did. Uh, we're into the second year uh, with our new work order and moving forward. So uh, that's the status of the SWAT program. And if there's any questions, or okay, I have any questions from the board of commissioners, Vice Chairman Robinson? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, a couple questions. So <laughs> keep this tight and right. Um, and, and, I'm going to call him Director Peacock. I'm going to, I'm going to come back to these street lights. Um, it's a year later, right, when we kick this off. Um, we went through a whole process, <coughs> September, October, November, December, 1st of January. It's end of May. Um, that was supposed to be a quick win. The narrative that we had with amongst ourselves was there certain projects that could, you know, would take what they would take, like the building of a building, designing of a building, etc. But this just seemed like, it didn't seem like it was a priority. And that bothers me. Um, it, it, it bothered me that it didn't, I, mean, I shouldn't have to make these type of comments on something that, 120 lights? Odd lights? I mean, you would think that it would be important. <coughs> Um, I, I say that um, for the following. That, and, and here's the thing that we were looking for a little bit more proactive accountability, right? So let, let's just say citizens hold mm -hmm. us accountable, right? I think likewise our partners and vendors have to get in the ring with us and, and have likewise, um, as I would think, concern or proactive delivery. Uh, I'd, I'd like to, and we, we keep getting, I mean, I, I've got to say this, but it's disturbing when, now I go to um, community meetings, HOA meetings, town halls, <coughs> whatever the case may be, and I have to give these, these narratives. And I, I try, I'm, I'm pretty accurate in what I tell people as being the truth. And then we get these you know, I, I, it, it makes us look bad as commissioners when we're out there and we say one thing, and while we don't mind covering staff, while we don't mind supporting our partners and stuff, it's like at some point, like, oh, hold on now. There, it, we, we just, we don't do that just to be spending it toward the government against the people, right? So there, there's, a, there's a fine line where we, yes, government, you, we got our partners, we want to deliver to the public, but it's like, no, we're only going to go so far. Like, hold on. And so um, I'd like to, Director Peacock, what, what was your findings when, you, when we reached out? I asked you to reach out to, uh, can you give a little bit more insight, please? I can, thank you. Uh, I first spoke with uh, Terry and Rich uh, to get their impression of what uh, the status and the, uh, the uh, progress of the uh, project was. Uh, uh, Rich had already spoken that same day uh, to the officials over at Greystone uh, and based on our uh, conversation with Vice Chair, I called that same day and spoke with the officials there. Uh, and they had reasons 
some of it due to weather, some of it due to uh, other construction events. Uh, but uh, the major finding that came from the discussion that I had with Greystone was that they didn't know it was a priority item. That they didn't feel they had been told that it was a priority item to get the street lights done in a fast, timely manner. Uh, I made quite clear to them that it was a priority item and that we expected uh, them to, uh, to bring more resources to bear on the project. They had a very a skeleton crew working on that project. Uh, and they committed to have at least one more crew this week out there helping with the progress of the uh, construction and in, in, uh, installation of those street lights. So uh, again, there, uh, they did not feel that it was, that we had appropriately <coughs> told them that it was a priority item. Thank you. Mm -hmm. you, you did exactly what I, I knew you would do, and, and thank you for that report. Which, which brings me back full circle. How did this not, how was this not clear in a priority? And, and again, I, I, I won't belabor this. I think it's, um, I'll have my own conversation because there's no way this administration had not conveyed, at least I know I had. Now again, I represent <coughs> the people. So then I come back to the administration and says, guys, how did this not get over to our partners to let them know? But y'all shouldn't even have to do that. I mean, we, I mean they're pretty prominent, right? Um, they're pretty engaged. Um, there's no way, I mean, one more time, are we paying attention? Like, how could this not be? So the citizens, so look how the citizens, I've got to go up town halls and they're looking at me. Well, you keep saying, you keep saying, you keep saying, Commissioner Robinson, you said, you said, and it's like these guys sitting there like, well, it's not a priority. Like, how's it not? You know, the bill that's going to come off 120 street lights? <laughs> like, what, what is their, I mean, what are they thinking? I mean, who else, I mean, where else in this county where we're doing that type of work? I mean, where, where is the business about it? I mean, put the people to the side. It's like, guys, I'm putting up 120 lights. You got a light bill behind that scroll come online, and you tell me that's not a priority? All right, I'm going to let that go. Thank you, Bill. Uh, you, you were very diligent in finding that out. Um, Rich, thank you for you just sort of following through on that. Um, but I had to put that out there for the public, and, and especially for District 2, that no, we, we, you know, sometimes somebody has to take responsibility for their own actions, right? It, it, everything can't be covered by the system. And this is one which I, I thought I'm very disappointed in sort of our progress to date. Okay, we're gonna put one more crew on it. I didn't think it was, I mean, but how do you even, I didn't feel. Like those are words like, how, why is that even being introduced? This is business, we contracted something. We, this process was important for the people and it just, it just makes us feel a certain kind of way. All right, we're gonna move on. All right, next thing. Um, uh, the community center, Rich. Um, I, and again, back to the design work. I, I just for the timeline, one more time, and I, again, I've got a series of meetings, timeline-wise. The time that it takes to design and then move into a build. What are those two phases, roughly? I'm just, roughly. Gotta get the contract executed kick it off, you're looking about seven or eight months worth of design, I think they said, eight months of design work. Eight months of design. And how long would it take to build that, that size type of building? They were putting 12 months, I think. 12 months, or 18 months, I'm sorry, 18 months, a year and a half to construct it. Year and a half to construct it, and then uh, it's a, we're talking, what, 2020? Did I do that right? Close it up? Yeah. Late 19, I mean, give or take. So I, I just gotta preface my commentary. All right. All right. Thank you for that. And um, I'm gonna yield. That's it. I'll, 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 I'm gonna come back with one more question. I, I'm gonna just frame it, which is around the softness in our numbers. Um, and, and Director um, Hallman, we'll talk about this a little bit later. But I, I'm, I'm, I'm always mindful of the numbers, um, the softness. Um, I, I recognize as long as we pay the bond, <laughs> that's my, my major priority. Yes. Uh, make sure that that's taken care of. Um, don't, don't compromise it the financial position of our, our credit rating, but at the same point, it's something to watch. Um, and so while I know that we like to fill in the extra, um, it, it may be, the, you know, again, it's just prudent, cautious, patience. In other words, let it build on the back side, then you go back and fill in all the pockets, but we just need to make it through these next couple of years. You've emphasized that I won't belabor. Okay. I yield. Okay. Commissioner Guider. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, Rich, you said that there was a little money left over from the uh, paving. Uh, 
Uh, <clears throat> I couldn't see the figure. There's a head in my way right here. So he's <laughs> living. I'm living. So, uh, but anyway, how much was it? And what happens to that money? Does it roll over into the 2018 paving program? <laughs> you always recognize when we do have cost savings. <laughs> now, for the 2017 paving program, we finished it at $2.8 million, $2,836,000. So there's about $160,000 that, that'll get rolled into the 2018, okay. or just, if you remember, you've got $3 million for six years. There's $18 million in that bucket of money. So we'll spend that, you know, maybe we up the budget next year or something, but we'll keep that cost <coughs> savings in that category of resurfacing program. And maybe we, next year we can add another street or, or things well, like didn't that. Didn't we have to lower the budget this year on paving uh, down to 2.5? Well, yes. So that will put it up a little bit mm -hmm. closer right. to the three million that's projected that we were going to use every year. Correct. Our, um, our budget this year. Because of the collections, we've had to adjust. Just a little bit, not much. Okay. Another so it's still being used for resurfacing. It's just right. We're using five hundred thousand for the mat for the LMIG mat. So it's still yes. going towards resurfacing. Yeah. Okay. Um, and on uh, the Sweetwater uh, Road uh, intersection, um, you were saying that uh, Paulding was uh, minimizing the uh, right of way. I guess uh, is that acceleration deceleration lanes? Or Correct. The turning lanes. <coughs> Now, who will be doing the paving on that? I know we're we're splitting the cost of the light itself, mm -hmm. but who's going to be doing the paving part of that? Are we splitting that also? It'll be in a construction contract. And if I'm not mistaken, I thought uh, we, Douglas County, were going to issue the contract for that intersection. So Douglas so. County's paying the entire, uh, the paving part of it for the deceleration? No, no ma'am. Um, we're going to the share. What the cost We're going to share it. Fifty-fifty. Okay. Yeah. The project will be bid out, and then we'll support the cost down. Okay. So Paulding County is paying part of it too. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, highway five. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh, I was on Highway five uh, last Saturday. Not this Saturday. I was out of town, but last Saturday, um, traffic was backed up to Winona uh, Drive, which is up there where the Publix is going north okay um and i sent mark an email from my phone to tell him about it because of, i don't know if the lights are messed up or what but it, it seems like the backup has been worse here lately i don't know if lights have been adjusted or whatever well georgia dot has been <coughs> tweaking those lights as a result of that project and they're still but they're not the tweaking them right i can tell you that and you anybody <laughs> that lives on that side of the town can tell you that. Well, that may be the case, but, it's, but it was two lanes of traffic backed up from Douglas Boulevard all the way up past Stewart Parkway up to Winona. It was two lanes of traffic backed up that day. And um, of course it was Easter weekend, so that, that was probably some of it. But um, I'm still <coughs> concerned about the north turn lane. <laughs> I know we're talking, what you've been talking about are the two turn lanes coming from the north to the south onto Douglas Boulevard, right? No, no opposite. Ma that's totally separate. That's not part of SPLOS. That's an existing project. What we've been talking about is the northbound. <laughs> the northbound north right turn lane. The right turn lane. Has anybody talked to anybody about buying the right of way for that? No, we're working on it. I keep hearing that. <laughs> but I mean, it's a, it's a GDOT route. So there's, I mean, there's a lot of, they have to be involved with it too. Um. <coughs> but they, uh, we work together on a project that's a yes, state project and everything. Uh, so uh, somebody told me that the city was doing the contact with the owner of the uh, shopping center right there. And then <coughs> are they going to do it? Are we going to do it? Or what? It's included in our plot. <coughs> It's included in our splash, yes, but it's in the city. Yes, ma'am. Okay. But uh, we're not contacting anybody. We have not contacted anybody then. I'm not aware of anybody we contacted, no. Well, you know, they've redone the, the whole uh, uh, shopping center there. Mm -hmm. 
and they're opening mm -hmm. new stores mm -hmm. and they've got this vacant lot right there on the corner where, that we need badly. <laughs> we need half of it at least. <laughs> so we can no, have probably that. not half, but just <coughs> enough to get that right turn lane in. Yeah. So um, I would hope that this would be a priority. <laughs> Like uh, this has been something that's been going on for years and years, and it's getting worse. Uh, mm -hmm. So, um, and uh, the left turn lane causes a lot of problems with a lot of the backup, along with the lights not being tweaked. <laughs> but um, please pursue that diligently. I, I beg you. Everybody on the western side of the county <coughs> begs you to do that. So, uh, all right, I yield back. Okay, any other comments? Commissioner Mitchell? Um, you spoke about the sidewalks. <laughs> yes. I'll pick me again on the sidewalks. I was kind of... Sidewalks are out on the street right now. We're expecting proposals this Friday <coughs> for the design and engineering of, at the three schools. Mm -hmm. Got it. Okay. And, and we've contacted a whole host of folks who said, yes, we plan on bidding. Got it. And uh, are these uh, uh, local or is going to be out of county or because my other question will allude to how we're coming along with the locals, uh, the minorities and so on and, and ensuring that these guys are participating in the plus expenses. Our expectation is you'll see both. We've had some out of the county, some of the existing AMEs that we're already working with mm -hmm. and then some of the smaller folks here in Douglas County <coughs> all expressed an interest in submitting prices okay. for that engineer. Okay. So, so I'm, I'm expecting all of them. Okay, okay, so they're, they're engaged. And you spoke about the 160 rough, roughly thousand savings on the paving program. Yes, on the paving. For for clarity, it, it will stay within the category. Correct. It will be still prioritized as kind of as we move through this whole process. Mm -hmm. So it won't be shifted out. So it will be how the project kind of comes through. And if we happen to get below the line, we we will. Correct. But if we can't, it will stay more or less where it is in the particular category so we won't we won't get outside of that correct it'll stay in that category it'll stay in the resurfacing program yeah. okay okay so we'll make sure we're clear on that end. and and the radio system one more brief briefing debriefing radio on. system motorola is working <coughs> on the engineering of it and they're working on the site locations backup power and uh, the towers themselves yeah now i, I was going to recommend because Motorola knows a whole lot more about digital radio systems yes. than Richville Lane. If you would like, uh, I could have them come in once a quarter or however, whatever frequency you see fit and let them brief you on the digital radio system. Yes. It's the biggest, highest priority we've got. Yes. Yeah, once a quarter. <laughs> once a quarter. We'll, we'll make those arrangements. We'll get them ready. That'd be great. Okay. And outside of that, uh, that's, that's all I've got. I'll yield back. Okay. Just a brief, <coughs> brief statement to uh, Buttress, uh, Commissioner Guider's remarks on Highway 5 intersection there. Uh, I know that we're not uh, necessarily prime drivers as, as being in, in the city, but uh, I would ask and uh, repeat uh, Commissioner Guider's remarks that we be plugged in and informed and, and, and kept uh, uh, pushing status reports, status updates mm -hmm. on that because it's, it's very, very, very important. And so we need to be more. I'd say proactive. I, I know it's not entirely in our basket, but we could be better informed, I think. Mm -hmm. right, now you get back. Okay. <coughs> then I have a comment regarding Highway 5. Um, Mark, uh, we've had, or should I say, kind of administrator, we've had uh, numerous discussions about that light being synchronized on Highway 5 in Douglas, uh, and also Director Valentin. I, I know the gentlemen are working, <coughs> and it seems like they're working uh, far. They're not right here. They're remote working somewhere. If they could just come out on a Saturday and experience what we experienced, then they could probably understand how we want those lights synchronized. If they could just come and feel it. Sometimes it's easy, you know, when you're from a distance and on a computer, it's not working, but if they could just come get in the floor of the traffic, and then they could probably do a better job of helping us. Can we request them to do that? Yes, okay, thank you. And then um, my next, I just wanted to ask, and, and Commissioner Mitchell hit on a little bit, are we still tracking the data for the contractors locally to see who's, I noticed you didn't have that report today. I didn't have it. It was my understanding Terry briefed me <coughs> last month when I was out, but I will I will do it again next month. I'll have it updated, and I will present that data next month. Is it growing? We, if it's stagnant, we probably not. Is it moving at all? <coughs> it, it hasn't really changed. Yes, yeah, so it hasn't changed. Changing. Last year one, okay. now we're getting our new contracts for last year two. Okay. So there probably won't be much change until the summer. Okay. If I had to, yes. Yeah, 
Okay. But we'll get it up. <coughs> we'll present it next month. No problem. Okay. Thank you so much. Commissioner uh, Robinson, I believe you had something. Yeah. I, I, I just wanted to, if I listen to the theme of all my colleagues about, if you notice, when it comes to the spots, and it's, it's just sort of a, an awareness that <coughs> inside the government, we spend and we get our stuff done fast. We buy stuff. We get stuff done. Right, we move along, we deliver. I mean, don't, don't get me wrong. But if you look at the projects that are being highlighted by my peers, these are things that impact citizens directly. I don't disagree with, with Madam Guider. I, I don't disagree with um, Commissioner Mitchell. I mean, the, you know, um, passage to safety, um, you know, intersections, street lights. These are things that the public endowed us with <coughs> to be faithful over, right? And yet, it, it just appears that. We do our job internally, but our partners seem to sort of like, well, okay. And I get we have to work together, but I think that there, we, there has to be a higher level of touch with us <coughs> to our partners. I mean, you guys are going to do your job. You're doing your job. Don't get me wrong. That's, that's not my, my, my point. My point is, if you just look at what was just said and what we highlighted, it's the things that the citizens said, well, can I get some street lights? Can I get the, the lights synchronized? Can I, can I get some paving? I mean, can, what can we get out of this where, we, you know, if you look at the spend, it's all internally focused. So just an observation that um, as you guys are um, county administrator, uh, program manager, um, you guys can ensure that the narrative toward our partners is that they're more of a, so Madam Chair, you know, it's, it's a team. And it, it can't be, well, We'll get around to it. We didn't know it was the priority. That, that, that concerns me that the message is not getting to them. You're doing your job internally, but our partners are sort of left on their own. It's like, oh, okay. And I, I think there has to be higher accountability. But something to take that back amongst your team. I yield. Okay. Any other questions or discussions before we go to the next uh, presentation? Thank you so much. Um, Mr. Berlang, and appreciate you coming in on your crutches today. Yes, sure. Gotta but keep working. Yes. Okay, next we have a presentation from our own Russ Martin, a review of Douglas County's uh, Information Services Cyber <coughs> Security Strategy. Thank you, Director um, Martin. Thank you, ma'am. Mm -hmm. So I timed this and it takes me just under 71 minutes. So at the, uh, at the urging of our, the chairman of the technology committee, we put together a quick, a quick presentation on cybersecurity for the county. A lot of things have been going on around cybersecurity for several municipalities, and we recognize that. And although we can't go into a ton of details, um, because it is security related, we do want to give you a brief overview of what we are doing and how we feel about where we stand. <coughs> so there's a handful of recent breaches that most, some of them you're aware of, some of them not. Atlanta, everybody's aware of what's been going on in Atlanta. Um, that's a tough thing for them, right? And they're working really hard to solve all that, but they're still working on it. I don't know if any of you knew, 40 locations of Wendy's. There's actually 43, I think, in the state of Georgia were hacked. And so did, did you get that briefing? Yeah, I don't, I don't think so. Uh, they lost a lot of credit card data on that. Uh, but this is a, a list of, um, within the last two years, things that have gone. Colorado DOT, uh, they had 2,000 employees who could not work. Uh, because of a ransomware attack. Uh, I think Atlanta was actually a number larger than that. One that kind of struck home with me, the Johnston Community Schools in Iowa, probably haven't heard about that one either. They had a, a breach there where a lot of the uh, personal information about the students was taken away. Mm -hmm. So the way parents found out about it was they started getting text messages from the attackers threatening their children. Um, so this is one that really hit home with me, having kids in school. Uh, that these guys could get that kind of information uh, and that they could, you know, just wreak havoc and fear in the community um, through the information they were able to receive. So that's one of the reasons why this is really important and why it's something that we have to uh, stay ahead of. Uh, Georgia Tech, although it wasn't students, uh, they lost a lot of information on their employees uh, just recently. So we got to take a layered approach to this, and, and the first one is like keep them out, right? We just want to keep them out. We can keep them out. We're in good shape. So for us, we use high availability firewalls. Uh, so these are the things that keep our environment separated from the internet itself. Uh, this looks at all the traffic we have going back and forth, outside and in. So we do have intrusion detection. Uh, we do web content filtering, which means we're able to stop some. Uh, malicious stuff on the way in and also we control what you can see uh, when you try to go out and also common viruses things that we know about 
uh, can be blocked before they're ever, ever able to get in. I think if you, if you look at the case of Atlanta, um, a lot of the speculation, but it looks like that they were attacked because one of their web-facing applications had old software. Uh, the hackers were able to intrude using old code uh, and an unpatched system. So we make sure, one of the things we make sure, and it's not to say that Atlanta wasn't doing this as well and they just overlooked it, uh, but we do make sure that we're keeping up with Microsoft patches and patches from software vendors that we use to make sure that we're getting the most critical um, security related patches installed on our machines in a timely basis. And then we also do email filtering. Uh, about 80% of all the emails that come into Douglas County are spam. So they have some kind of link in them that's going to take you to some malicious site. They have an attachment that may contain malicious code. So about 80% of all the email that comes in is actually garbage. And we collect that and throw it away before you ever see it. That's some of the ways that we work on keeping people out. Protection from within, a couple of years ago, um, it wasn't uncommon over the fire department actually for us to get uh, this uh, virus called CryptoLocker. Uh, it would go in, it's same, similar ransomware type, you know, scenario that we're seeing over in Atlanta, but on a much smaller scale. Um, we determined at that point that the virus technology that we were using was insufficient. As we looked across the landscape of virus technologies, there's two ways most people do it. One is called DAT-based. It's the, the uh, virus software downloads a file every couple of days. It tells it about all the viruses that we know about and it doesn't let them run. Um, that always keeps you a couple of days behind because you have to download this file. They have to recognize the virus, create fixes. They have to put together a package, you got to download it, and then you have to distribute it. So what we went with was a more state-of-the-art artificial, artificial intelligence type um, virus scanning software. Uh, we really like it since we installed it. We've had zero uh, virus infections, no ransomware. And we do have evidence of catching some, uh, but they weren't able to proliferate ripple through the system. Um, it also gives us really good visibility into what's happening in the environment. Uh, and it's really lightweight. The one we used before would actually bog down your computer and this works a lot faster. Also protecting us on the inside is employee testing and training. Uh, we make sure that we have a, a part in the orientation process for all new employees. So we do come in, spend a few minutes with all new employees as they're oriented into the uh, HR process. And we do spend time with them that way. We also have biannual training. April, you'll see it happen again. We ask everybody to go out for some online training. It takes anywhere from 10 to 25 minutes, depending on the package that we distribute at that time. And it just gives all our employees an opportunity to see what's happening in the environment, get them a little more educated about what viruses, spyware, spam, uh, and things are happening now. And then we do monthly testing, and probably everybody in here you know, gets these things. I know <laughs> some people that are a little more vocal about it than others. Um, but so we do send spam out on purpose, we let it get through, we control it. Um, but it's a way of kind of testing employees to let them see what it looks like and see how, um, how apt we are to discard these things. And we do track it to see how many people clicked on the link, how many people didn't click on the link, um, and what it was. I think free food gets people the best, you know, until we get people the it's coupon. <laughs> it's coupons work really well, right? I think it was a free pizza, pizza hut, and kill people. <laughs> Atlanta probably, the, the IT director, the CIO for Atlanta probably could have stood before their board of commissioners three or four days before their breach and gave a very similar presentation to this. He could have felt really good about where they were and what they were doing and been very confident in their posture leading up to that attack. It, it's a fact, right? So they, they failed, right? So the challenge became not the failure at that point. That's, that can happen. It's recovering from that. And we saw uh, three weeks out, uh, they're still challenged with getting critical systems online. We feel like we're in a much better position than that personally. They may have felt in a much better position before that. The way we do backup and recovery is that uh, a lot of times the way it works is you take critical data on the computers and it's just the data and you back that up somewhere and then you archive that over time and if you have some kind of failure, some kind of breach, you go back and you grab that data, you find a clean machine, you restore all that data and you bring it back up. That's a real timely, you know, time consuming process. 
The way we do it's a little bit different. What we do is we actually take server level snapshots of all our machines. So we keep a cloned image of the machine up and running, not the data off of it. So instead of just having the data files that we'll have to restore, what we have to do is just figure out at what point it was running good and then point you back to that copy of it that's already up and running. And so where most people back up data, we back up entire servers. That allows us, one, we, we copy those things locally. So we have a device here at the courthouse that has these backups running. Should we have a breach, a ransomware attack where we have to shut down the server? Yeah, we'd have to do that. We'd have to shut them all down. What we'd have to do at that point is take a few minutes to identify, not a few minutes, some time, to identify when we received that ransomware, when that package was deployed in our network. Once we understand the point where it was received by our environment, we can step back to the most recent image we have that was not infected, and we can actually bring that up and start it running for use on the backup device, and we believe we can do that in about four hours. It wouldn't run nearly as fast as a full-size server would because it is a backup image of it running on a device that holds every image for every server in our data center. So it'd be slower, but we would have critical systems back online within about four hours. So we feel like the current status is good. Again, I think Atlanta may have said the same thing two days before uh, they had that. Uh, this is, for people who know security in here, goes, man, there's a lot of details Russ didn't give us. Absolutely not. This isn't the forum for me to start sharing a bunch of details about makes and models and, and releases and patches and those kind of things. Um, but we feel like it's pretty good. Um, we do realize there's some negative aspects and things going on in the One's just the pace of changes, right? This, there are new variants of old viruses coming out every day. And so it's very difficult to keep up with the pace of changes. Um, when I say lack of tools, you see when I go to the green one, which is the good stuff, I'm going to have tools on there too. We have tools, we have the essential tools that we need to make ourselves safe and to keep ourselves safe. Um, but there's just so many more things out there that we can do and that maybe we should do over time mm -hmm. just to make sure we stay on top of things. Um, aging software and hardware, uh, there's actually attached to the agenda item were two recommendations from the <coughs> technology committee. Uh, one for restoring funding for our PC refresh program, which is the method and the mode and the model that we would use to deliver uh, Windows 10 into our environment. Uh, Windows 7 is kind of the current platform for counting computers. Microsoft is ending s support for that in 2020, which gives us two years to replace the operating system for every county computer. Um, so we need, that's something we need to work on. Um, we haven't had a recent outside assessment, so it's always good every couple of years to have an outside organization come in and do something called penetration testing, uh, which is to see if they can get in, and if they can get in, what can they see, and provide you reports on that's kind of people are white hat hacking. Um, we also, the, the last two kind of go together. We don't have a dedicated security resource. Um, this is something that our network, our senior network administrator, um, and myself, we kind of tag team on. It's kind of tough to bridge that knowledge gap with the pace of changes uh, when the person you have focusing on it is also focused on a lot of other things. But then on the right side, we have always had great support from the Board of Commissioners and the Technology Committee. If we said it was important and that it was security related, uh, our Board of Commissioners and the Technology Committee have always done a great job, and this is more speaking to the community, to support this. So I feel like as we think, see things that we need to do and changes that need to be made, that we will have the support that we need to do that. We do have some really good essential tools so that we can see, we've talked about some of them, being able to block traffic coming in before it's ever a virus, uh, tools to be able to try to educate our employees and great things to have. Uh, the fact that we, we work with the GBI, GCIC, we actually have to recertify all the employees in the IS department yearly, um, and part of the GCIC certification process is making sure that our people understand how important it is that they follow process and they're um, paying attention to what we're doing. Organizational training, again, we have the process in place where we are sending out emails on a monthly basis, testing our end users, and biannually we send out training classes, and, and we had really good participation in that in October. Uh, you'll see information coming about about the new class 
um, in, in the next several days. The um, MS ISAC is an organization that's a nonprofit. Uh, it's multi-state ISAC. I don't know how y'all the acronym. So what they do is it's a, it's a group of, that the uh, feds have put together that monitors cybersecurity across the nation and provides updates uh, and training to IS departments <coughs> for state and local agencies. So we just started an association with them not too long ago and we're seeing a lot of information come out from them that's useful for us in trying to make sure that we stay secure. <coughs> and then again, uh, with GCIC and just the team that we have downstairs working on security and, and our IT department in general, uh, they understand how important this is. They understand that we don't want to be Atlanta, we don't want to be um, Equifax, right? We want to be secure, and so they're really careful when they ask questions, so we really appreciate it. And, and, and the good thing is our team really understands what it is we do. And with that, I'm done. Okay. Any questions from the board? I wish I got a little second hand. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, when you were talking about, was it Wendy's? Uh, yes, ma'am. That was hacked, and uh, the credit card information was uh, uh, gathered by the hackers. Yes. Uh, so are they retaining the credit card information? Is it that uh, a live transaction? It, it, you know, it's, it, that's interesting. So the way that we, and Douglas County, the way we do things is that we have a credit card processor as a vendor. And so for us, there's a device connected to the internet. Once you swipe it, yeah, it goes off site, yeah. and we do not retain that. Okay. An organization as large as Wendy's that does a number of transactions that Wendy's does, they probably act as their own credit card mm -hmm. processor because it saves them the fees, and therefore they would hold on to the credit card information. Okay. Uh, another thing, you said that we had not had <clears throat> an outside assessment done in a while. Uh, it seems like I remember a few years back when you first came on, we did we have an assessment, but that's, how long have you been there? <laughs> right, so you on five years. Five so, years, okay. Five and we, so how often should we have an outside assessment? Outside assessment, assessment should probably be done every other year. Every and other year? This year, we should, yes, we should have one done this year. Um, but tight budgets, those kind of things. That was uh, as part of the consulting budget that we would have used this year that was kind of, so we'll have to do So it's been five years since we've had one. No, we have, it hasn't been five years. We did one early on, then we did another one, I think, three years ago, which would make this year the year. That, you know. I remember we set up something about a redundancy process where if somebody was hacking in, it could, you could shut that off or something. It had to go to different servers. I, I don't know the, I remember the word redundant. <laughs> so I think that would be that would be the backup system that we're running. So uh -huh. yeah, as soon as we find out that we've been breached, we can shut that down. It, it'll there'll, there'll be a forensic process, right? Because we have to to go to one of those backup copies of the server and bring it up. If we go to a copy that was also already breached, um, then we wouldn't be in any better spot than we are now. So there will be a forensics process, which would take a little bit of time to determine when we were breached. Uh, but then we could come back up on one of those redundant servers okay. uh, in just a few hours. So it's a backup. Mm -hmm. yes. uh, now the 365 uh, Microsoft Office uh, system that we recommended in the technology committee, um, it had a big price tag. And I assume that we were talking about putting it on the table for next year? I believe right. so. so. Is it is it a, a threat? A, being on the, what, what seven? <laughs> we on seven? Right. So uh, for Microsoft Office, we're, our, our current standard is Office 2010. Okay. Um, the current version is it's Office 16. 2016. Yeah. And actually then there's there's Office 365, which but is the online version. But 365 is updated constantly. Correct. Right. And so the recommendation from the technology committee is that we move away from the standalone installed version and we move to the 365 version. There's a lot of reasons beyond security uh, to recommend Office 365 over uh, installed Office. Uh, one of them is security, uh, but that's not the only one. And as of right now, the Office 2010 version that we're running is still supported by Microsoft. So it is still receiving critical patches and vulnerability fixes. So from a security standpoint, we're okay with Office 2016 or 2010 with all reasons to move away from it. Well, we got a letter from the judge, Judge, judge Emerson, uh, very concerned about the uh, security of uh, Microsoft 10. So 
I, I, but you, you're saying that it would be all right to wait until 2019 budget? Yes, I think we would be fine. On there. But I the refresh is already on <coughs> this year's, uh, it's a BRR. It was in no BRR. Way. Pardon? No, ma'am, but it is proposed to be added on the next agenda item. Right. Oh, I thought it was a BRR. So it was, yeah, right. It was a 2016 BR that was, or 2017-18, what year is it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's a 2018 BR, but it, it was it was not one that was approved, but it is one that Mark is, is bringing back before the board today. But that will save y'all a lot of time. And right, and again, that the piece of refresh is the vehicle that we use to, to push out the new 2017. Right. So you are recommending that we go outside and have another outside assessment. Yes, I think we're overdue for an assessment and we should do that this year. All right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I yield back. Okay. <coughs> I put that off Michigan. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and it not, I'll be quick. I'm sure some of the committee members have, uh, have deeper context to add. So, um, yeah, I saw Atlanta and obviously it was something like, ooh. Um, <coughs> No, it was serious, and I, in, in, in one minute, it's not a big deal, and then all of a sudden, like, I'm, and, and as an elected official, I'm like, yeah, uh-huh. And I guess my question is, I, again, we can't only go so deep here, but it's almost like national security, right? There's a, there's a context, like, no, this is serious, right? This, we, we, nobody's immune, nobody's exempt. So here's my question. Um, one, do you have sufficient funding? For backup, whatever is necessary, I need to. I would like to know what that number is. If y'all already down that path and the different components of it, I'd like to know what that is. Um, it, it's just like your defense, like your military, like our public safety. There's a number, and there's elements to it. And while we believe all it can happen, yes, it can. <laughs> and so let, let's just be serious about this. Not in this open forum. I get it. Y'all guys go offline, do your secret squirrel stuff, whatever. Let, let us know. <laughs> For those who know what that is. But but my second question then becomes um, recovery. And I, I'd like to see, like with anything, do you have exercises that, okay, let's take this down. Let's do this. I'm, I'm concerned that we could get hijacked. I mean, we're a modern sized county. We ain't got the deepest budget. I don't want to overemphasize our comfort, but like, okay, well, let me put this out here from my perspective. I'm going to trust my peers to, to make proper recommendations. But I'm like, oh, guys, uh, and I, I, I appreciate giving assurance, right? We, but, but it's not that the sky is not falling either, but it's one of those, like, I like to look at it. I want a real clean, I like to see a real clean look at this. Um, and what happens when it goes off? And do we practice those things? It's about operational readiness, right? I look at, uh, we do a very good job physically going through all the things as it relates to security, but you almost think that now that online is going to mimic offline. And I think likewise, our approach to it should be the same when we go through these exercises to prepare us. So, well, what happens if it does go down? And people are trying to pay taxes and all those things. And I, I know we're sort of, you know, sort of, but I like to take a little bit more serious. And so I'm going to just put that out there for consideration now, Chair, and, and you know, the committee structure. To really look at this, just like you guys do, when I see you guys do these exercises at Douglas Boulevard, all these, you know, I mean, you guys are, you, you, we take our physical security very seriously. It's, it's about operational readiness. In other words, something can happen, all right? So how do we respond? Are we ready for it? And so likewise, um, we, we don't want to be, well, I thought it would only take four hours, but it took us four weeks. And I, I like to see us run through those exercises to prepare ourselves. So just those two comments, um, I'd like for consideration to be given to um, um, some type of real budget for backup, whatever that means, data, servers, what is the number? Um, and, and, and it's irrelevant of what the, what the number is. It's the commissioners will figure out how to fund that. Number. But I'd like to know what does it co cost to really defend, like they know what the number is to defend our country. I'd like to know what it would take to defend us locally from a technological perspective. And the second thing is um, consider exercises for operational um, you know, readiness in events that we have. <coughs> and I'll, I'll yield to my colleagues. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Are you ready? Yeah. Uh, yeah, you're uh, Thank you for the briefing. It, it was enlightening. In fact, I've, I've kind of experienced some, 
some uh, phishing and spam on my emails and thanks to the training that I took. Uh, boy, I look at those email addresses mm -hmm. every time. Even if it's a name I recognize, right? You know, my daughter, for example, can have an extension to some university in <laughs> India or something. I know she's not emailed me from there. But uh, training was great. And I'm good, good to see that ongoing. You mentioned uh, uh, security resource, dedicated security resource. And that, that's an issue I think is really, uh, it's, it's about stepping up our game, but it's not a game. If you know what I mean. And I would like to see some consideration uh, uh, of that uh, position uh, in this uh, item five here. Uh, we need a, a laser focus on security. And I, and I mean laser focus. I mean somebody that will completely focused on cyber security issues and not having to keep up the server and, and do training and all these other things. As you alluded to, you're, you know, you're wearing right now, we're in several hats, including cyber security. Uh, so I would just like to put before this board here, I, I would like some consideration. I don't know what the dollar amount is, but I would like to see a uh, dedicated uh, security resource uh, that you mentioned earlier. And uh, I don't know how to handle that since we've already got an agenda item that's active. I yield back. Okay. Madam Chair. All right. Yeah, but it looked like you wanted to say something his response. Okay. Yeah. And, and, and thanks again and, and to the committee and, and everybody else. But we thought it was important that we bring this back to you guys and to the general public as much as we could say, as little as we could say, to make sure you understood that we were on top of the unique situations. There is no safe proof that, that, that will get us through this whole thing of never ever being hacked or whatever because these guys are, are extremely smart as to what they do and that's all they do. But, but yes, and, and we are working on numbers as the vice chair and you guys a uh, conversation um we could spend a whole <coughs> lot more to get there and we've had these conversations uh the question is um there's no there's no amount of money that would that would secure you 100 percent help me out am i correct yeah, absolutely. yeah. so um <coughs> it, it's just that we've got to at least do everything we can and i like i love the, the the idea of saying isolate somebody to just do that but that doesn't fix the whole problem of somebody still getting in through the back door. Mm -hmm. But we do a lot of uh, things from sending out emails where you guys take a, an ad of a pizza, get you a free piece of pizza, and some of you guys take the bait, and we understand, like, okay, this is kind of where the <laughs> right is free, free is free. Yeah. But overall, I appreciate the, the, the presentation, and, and we as the technology committee felt strongly that we need to kind of update everybody as to where we are, what it looks like. Uh, what we're working on and, and welcome any uh, any ideas and there are some numbers that's going to start coming this way and you're probably going to be shocked about some of the numbers but realistically it's not that it's something that we want as a committee it's something that we would need uh, and the details is, is coming and, and this is just the start of what we need to kind of be going so just a couple of so again thank you and uh, I won't go into all the, <laughs> the details and questions that we just kind of uh, I want to reiterate that, but just understand that this is serious, uh, and if we're not protected, uh, there's no 100% that we're going to be totally protected, but we just got to continue to try to out <coughs> these guys as to what they do versus <coughs> us clicking on the free pizza. But outside of that, I, I yield back. <laughs> uh, Russ, we hadn't talked about this much, but disaster relief, uh, we have off-site backup, do we not? Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, yep. I'll get back. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Question yeah, real quick. Uh, this is it, it somewhat, again, I'm posing the committee. You guys hear this. Legal. Um, if there is a hostage situation, I, I, I'd like to make sure we have what is our official policy? You know, do you negotiate? Do you not negotiate? That's the first thing. I'm taking this very seriously. Mm -hmm. What do you do? And secondly, <coughs> and I don't have a lead. I'm just, you, you work it out. The second thing has to do more with, um, do we have insurance? And are there policies that will allow coverage uh, in event to something? I mean, these are something we take offline. Um, I'm putting out there as a public, if we take it, you know, at some point, executive session, for somebody else to consider, that's fine. I'm putting it out there to say, yeah, well, it, are there, how do we protect ourselves from a true financial situation? Um, you're going in that, you know, 
I'll leave it at that. You guys get my point. Whatever the number is, we ain't, you know, there, there has to be some type of, um, you know, like reinsurance when tankers go down in the middle of the ocean. I mean, disasters happen. You don't, you don't try to. People, it happens. And so it, it, how do we protect ourselves from just the pure cash that we have and insurance is there to, to sort of uh, transfer the risk. And so I'd like to know what our risk transference um, options are and how much it needs to cost and if we need to still but, uh, begin to budget that into somebody's budget to deal with that. Mm -hmm. I yield back. Okay. I yield back. Okay. Um, Director Martin and also the Chairman of the Technology Committee, uh, Commissioner Mitchell, mm -hmm. Vice Chairman, Commissioner Guider, and also your entire team. We appreciate what you're doing to protect the vulnerability of cyberspace. And I just wanted to see if you could, and I know we talked about backup plans, but what about downtime processes for your specific areas, like the tax commissioner offices, where we have to continue to do your business? Do they have a plan in those individual departments in case there's a problem? Uh, should they? <laughs> I will nod to that's a good question. Yes. Uh, so, I mean, uh, we've discussed it with several departments, and I know where. Uh, so, so that's where you get in the disaster recovery business continuity piece, right? And that's the business that's continuity the piece. Um, yeah, because of the focus on disaster recovery, we really haven't reached for it. I know that um, Jason Milholland, as part of his, um, as part of the, the uh, what, was, what was the thing he was putting together? His coup, right. As part of his coup, he pushed a lot of people into needing to make those kind of decisions. So I would think we're probably further along than, than I know from a, a technology perspective. Uh, because again, Jason pushed people. Oh, there he is, right there. Jason pushed a lot of people into uh, that position of having to make those kind of decisions early on. So, um, as far as the business continuity, Jason may be able to to give us a little information there. You want to go? Yeah, please go to the yeah. Yeah. This way. Jason. Yeah. All right. Can you tell them what the question is again? Yeah, repeat the question. I was stepped out for a minute. <laughs> so, is it, yeah, so the question is along the lines of, should we have a disaster? As you move into the individual departments, do they know what to do without technology? It's very difficult without, um, without technology. We do backups on a continuity of operations plan. We do paper backups. Every department, every department can print out and have, should have a co printed copy of the continuity of operations. But it does, it works a lot. Uh, it slows you down. Right. Because trying to go through a, most Departments, I believe, is around 93 pages of, of different procedures they need to follow. Let's say the courthouse is gone for whatever reason. You know, just say the courthouse is no longer here. All these departments have to re find a place to relocate, take their stuff, what they need to re relocate. So they have their plans or online, off-site from Douglas County. It would be on the Douglas County server. They're, they're there too, but they're, they're backed up off-site. But they should have a printed copy because if the if it's that type of situation. All the servers may be down, you know, maybe other things going on, but they have those procedures in a printed copy. But it, it does slow things down by not having, by moving to a paper copy, but we have that backup. But it would slow it tremendously. But there is a process in place to take care of it. I'll just say, we got a backup to the backup to the backup. But if the backup to the backup goes, then you got another problem. So we can, we can continue to kind of look at all these safe measures, which we do, which I think we do though, but I mean, I keep saying there's 100% of no matter which way you decide to go, there's no 100% exactly. safe mechanism in place that we can do, and we can spend a ton of money, because we've talked about the, 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 the amounts of money that we can spend toward technology. Now, I'm not saying not to, but you, the more you spend, the more creative they're going to get. Mm -hmm. So then the more you'll spend to kind of get creative with them. Help me out, am I correct on this conversation? So no, you're, yeah, so there's, yeah. there's that law of diminishing returns, yes. right? So yes. you spend $10 to get 20% of the way, you spend right. another $10 to get 50% of the way, but then to get the 50% to 100% it costs you $100,000. Right. So the, the, you have to find that point on that graph where you're right. comfortable with the fact that, you know, we're going to do it up to this point, but if something happens beyond that, yeah, we may be, we may be down for two weeks. We right. just have to hope that, uh, that, and I know hope's a terrible strategy. I know. <laughs> but, uh, but there comes a point where that cost benefit analysis, right? That, that law of diminishing returns. So you say, you know, we're we're gonna do this much and if, if it exceeds that then right. then we're gonna we're gonna be in hard tough way. And we as a board gotta decide on if we are held hostage, what what, what is our policy? What, what do we anticipate on doing? Do we anticipate on paying the ransom to get back what we're gonna get? 
not to say they're going to do what they say they're going to do, but I mean, so there's a there's something that we got to look at as a board, as a policy, what we want to see happen. But we can spend a ton of money at technology, and still only get ten percent of the way there. So you still won't get the hundred percent that you're after. So just FYI. But we but we're at least having these kind of conversations. That's why I told Russ we need to at least have this conversation. So at least staff. Um, the community and others know that we're 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 zeroed in on these types of situations, and we do have all sites. We have clouds. We've got uh, firewalls. We've got all kind of things in place to help assure that that whomever may do whatever that they do, we can go back and, as Russ stated, we can go back to a file before mm -hmm. and put us back online. But we may still lose some data. I don't know, let's say a day or two, whatever that is. We may still lose something, but we can at least get back online and continue business as usual and find out where the situation occurred or where, where it was breached. Right, and that was, a, that was an important thing too. I saw yes. some commentary around Atlanta's breach, yeah. right, that, right, that sounded like people thought the guys there were asleep at the wheel. Right. I, I don't, I, I'm not there. I would dare say they weren't. Right. Uh, and we just wanted to come in front of you, right, and show yes. you we're, we're not asleep at the wheel. Right. Bad things happen to people right. sometimes, mm -hmm. and you prepare as best you can. And that's all we can do. So, yes. again, thank you. But that, that's all I got. Yes. Okay. Any other questions, concerns for us? Thank you so much, and thank you. I'll direct you to come home as well. <coughs> Next, you have to point <laughs> you. <laughs> the minutes. I just want you to take a look at the minutes for tomorrow, and we'll discuss the minutes tomorrow, board commissioners. Um, we have a proclamation tomorrow, which is tab number four, and that will be presented by Breezy Stratton, uh, proclaiming the month of April 2018 as Boys and Girls Club Month in Douglas County. Tab number five, county, well, before I go, tab, uh, county administrator, do you have any comments or do you have anything today? Um, no, not besides what's on the agenda. Number five, right? Yes, we visit 2018 general fund recommended budget improvement request BRRs and approve and amend the 2018 budget. Um, direct, I mean, uh, county administrator Teal. Um, we were asked to, re to review or revisit the BRRs um, that were not approved last year um, as a result of the way we ended the year at a, I think it was positive 545,000. Is that right, Jennifer? That's correct. Um, so we ended the year ahead of what we thought we were going to. So we looked at the BRs, or I did, and, and uh, made some recommendations. Um, so there's two different columns, and I'll go over the ones that would be included in the budget. They're recommended for the budget first. Um, so the Civic HR, what, sorry, got my colors wrong. So PC refresh, which is what we were just talking about with the uh, Bush, or Bush mm -hmm. Okay, there you go. Um, so PC refresh and uh, laptop refresh. We've actually never done a laptop refresh before, so this will be the first time on that. Um, so total for the PC refresh, 84610 That's what's in the budget, uh, are these budget numbers. 30000 for the laptop refresh. Uh, the next item is imaging software for records. This is to replace the existing software where the existing imaging software we have is obsolete um, and the people we're currently using have, they're trying to get us to upgrade, but the upgrade will not, the existing data will not transfer. Mm -hmm. So what Aubrey has done, and she's already been to the technology committee, I think, um, so she has a new vendor, um, with new imaging software, and this is for, for our records that we, we don't need to lose these. Um, so the next three items, that was $139,895. That, that one was at the top of the list with the, with the computers. So the next three, um, so solicitor uh, assistant attorney, uh, 74801 um, and then two, the next two would be for the coroner. So department iPad mini for investigators and yearly cost for record management. Um, and if you'll skip down to the last four items on the list, so a transportation project analyst. Um, this person would work in the transportation. Now this actually was not a BIR 
Um, but it's a position that we do need. Um, yeah, Transportation Committee recommended um, that we move forward with this. Um, so they would actually mainly be working on Georgia DOT projects um, with the county and the ones especially that have federal funds. We have to track all that stuff um, to a T. Then also uh, engineering inspector. This is not the spliced uh, inspector. This is an engineering slash utility inspector um, and a vehicle um, for that position. Um, and then a human resources assistant part time. Uh, we funded uh, part of last year, part of this year with just month funds we had left over. Um, <coughs> but this would be a yearly part time position for HR, which they desperately need. So those items total $526,062, um, which is within what we were asked to do, the fund balance that was over what was projected for 2008, where we ended 2017, sorry. Um, so the next column are items out of these BRs that I'm recommending that we purchase out of 190. Um, and I'll give you the totals at the bottom. Um, so the Civic HR online application, right now, in order to fill out an application with the county, you have to print it and either fill it out by hand or put it in a typewriter and type it. Um, and so this would help out HR, it would help out uh, mm -hmm. Jennifer's department, everything would be automatic. Once we have an application, we have all the person's data, then it would be automatic. You can transfer to New World and all that stuff. Um, so, replace EOL switches at various locations, um, $10,000. Actually, this next one would come out of uh, 911 funds, but replace wireless at E911, $4,800. So, in addition to the imaging software, records needs a new large format scanner and a computer for that scanner. Um, that's 6500 and plus about 600 bucks for the computer. So they're about 11, 9 or 10 items um, for fleet. The largest one being a, another uh, heavy duty truck lift, six, six post truck lift. And so those items total about 120,000. Um, and then the weather worn and then siren cabinets for uh, emergency management. Those are two smaller items at about three or four, about 4,000 total. Um, so this brings us down to $857,585 and one ninety. Um, so when you subtract out the 336,000 it was approved two weeks ago for the uh, fuel pumps and then the 95, 95 for the uh, security cameras. So that leaves us about 430000 in uh, 190 So we should be sitting pretty good there with that. We do have some items coming up for bid. We have money in the budget. I think we have 540000 left for the security at the courthouse. That's, we really don't know how much that project's going to cost. But we're going out for bid here within uh, hopefully the next month or two. And then... Uh, Those items should be fine. Any questions? Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. Michelle. <laughs> you asking his, her <laughs> if she has any questions. Um, if a department is running over their projected budget, and they did so last year tremendously, and we're approving a BR, BRRs for that department, Aren't we enabling them to continue to um, run over their budget? Well, the budget last year, and I think I know which, which one you're alluding to, is the budget was not even uh, set appropriately because it was based off the previous budget uh, that was used by the pre previous quarter that exceeded the amount. But I, I, I think the, the BRR that's approved for this one that deals with efficiency. We are still on paper, uh, such as that HR online. I, I was blown away to 
joined an organization that's still on paper in 2018-17. So the, the goal is to get a lot of these departments off paper so we can track this information better. And um, that's why this is a system. It's not related to anything that's going to impact her bottom line, except this is a one-time capital expense to allow them to become efficient. Well, uh, the um, software, is that something she already, they already have? Uh, and this is something that we have to pay annually for? I was kind of confused about that part. It says it? yearly cost for record management. Mm -hmm. So th why would that be a BRR? Why wouldn't it have been in the budget to begin with? Because it was new. It was a new BRR. It's a new system. Oh, system, yes. Okay. But uh, it does trouble me, and I just wanted to voice my opinion. <laughs> um, when someone's running over their budget, uh, and it's trending every month, it's not just one month, it's trending every month. And they're short. Because when it came before the technology board, we were able to believe that she they had they had the money in their budget. Mm -hmm. And then when I get the report on the budget and I take it home to study it, I see that she, they've overrun their budget already by three percent, which is about six thousand mm -hmm. dollars. Already, just for this year. So uh, something is going to have to give on that somewhere, and I just wanted to voice my opinion about that. Okay. Commissioner Mulkey. Yeah, uh, my earlier remarks about the resource uh, for uh, a dedicated resource for cybersecurity for our IT department. Uh, I think probably more appropriate would be coming as a recommendation from the uh, uh, technology committee, mm -hmm. uh, but I would just say I would I would hope that they would look at that favorably and perhaps we could do something this year, later on the year, mid-year, mm -hmm. or third quarter, whatever. Uh, I think it needs to be a priority to uh, have a, a single focus uh, uh, on that security issue. So okay. I can kind of resend my remark about modifying this BIR, but let's, let's kind of go through our committee process. Okay. I yield back. Thank you. Question Yeah, I've got a the transportation analyst role. I, I think that's something that um, it, it's already been spoken to, but I just want to, um, we take a lot of grants, we accept a lot of grants um, in this county, uh, whether it's judicial, whether it's public safety, whether it's general government, these are federal grants, <laughs> not just necessarily facilitated through you know, regional commissions, but straight direct federal grants that we've always done as a funding mechanism. And with that comes certain amount of uh, requirements and of, of reporting. And um, as you know, we, we tend to have um, money that comes through our DOT and Georgia DOT. And um, our transportation area needs to uh, uh, strengthen its capacity. And I won't even say it has capacity, and I think that's the whole point of this role, is to make sure that we can meet those expectations. Um, if we're ever audited, um, you know, you're, you're, like, even personally audited, it, it, it's, it's a big deal. And sometimes if you're ahead of the game and you're reporting like you should, uh, even though they do random sampling of audits and you could just be your term, not that they were looking for anything, we just uh, they picked us. It's just one of those where we need to respond to. Um, and I, I think this is a very needed role. We're going to bring this back up later today um, and definitely during our transportation committee tomorrow. Um, and I'll talk about that later. But this is one role that I think is, is very needed, Madam Chair. So I'm glad to see it in there. Thank you. Yeah, I was remiss in, uh, in before. Okay. Uh, that was actually one of my other remarks. And I wanted to uh, reinforce what the Vice Chairman Robinson remarked on this. We, we've had uh, uh, quite a bit of discussion about this position and it goes to the fact that uh, I think we're on, ongoing uh, an audit, a federal audit, uh, federal monies audit right now and we don't have anybody that's primarily or solely focused on uh, monitoring and making sure all the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed so that we don't uh, uh, come up with a, uh, a failing score in terms of, of the federal audit. So uh, I think this is very much a very important uh, function that we need to provide. 
our director with, our transportation director with, as well as the uh, engineering <coughs> inspector. So I, I appreciate the chairman's comment on that. I yield back. Commissioner Bader. One other uh, question, well, comment is um, calcium chloride has been taken out, uh, which are treat the dirt roads. And of course, we all know most of the dirt roads are in my district. Uh, I'm hoping that somewhere down the line, the Transportation Committee will see fit to put this back uh, in the budget because you're going to be getting a lot of calls from a lot of people about their dirt roads. Um, and people have allergies uh, right there. Um, the Sextons, I know that the Sexton has dust allergies and right behind her house is a dirt road and she has problems with it every year. So. Um, just um, it needs to be a priority. But uh, it may not require ninety thousand because I think we're going to do something with millions on one of our dirt roads. So hopefully um, we can put some more money back in there for the calcium chloride. That's as important as paving to some of us. Thank you. Okay. <coughs> yeah. Then I just want to clarify because. Duly noted, I, I think, you know, at least I've always taken a position that each commission understands its own character area. And so um, I've always been sensitive and, and, and open to uh, the commentary where District 4 does represent um, a, a big segment of our, our, our land mass, per se. And I, I hear conflicts. I hear we like it, dirt roads, we like it like that. Then on the other hand, I hear that, okay, we want to resurface, we need to resurface, we need more money. And it's trying to hear that balancing act, right? And, and again, it's not either or. I think it's both. So I, I think to a certain extent, to the extent that, and I'm glad you shared this, which is, okay, if you want, like I always say, let it be. Let them be. If you're saying that, well, like Warren Road was one that was always in, in District 2 that we finally had to address. It was probably mid-year through my, my second term, we finally got that addressed. Um, over there by Brookmont, cutting through, and it, it finally got done. Um, everybody doesn't like dirt rolls, and some people do, uh, but I have no problem in advocating for that if, in fact, it, if we, in other words, if you want it resurfaced, we can focus on that as a priority. If you want, what do you call it? Chlorine, calcium, chlor chlor calcium chloride? Mm -hmm. It's not a problem. I, I just, if you could help us identify what those rolls are, uh, and I'm, Miguel, okay. do you know these they rolls? Know. Yeah, that's a, <laughs> I, 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 you know the roads and, yes. and what it would cost and if it's 90, I mean, I'd like to, I have no problem putting that on a, an annual maintenance per se, and I don't think, uh, at least out of the committee, we did not push it out, but nevertheless, I'll be glad to take a look at that. How okay. about that? All right. Thank you. Okay. Any other, any other comments? I just wanted to close out with you on some of these, uh, on your questions, Commissioner Guider. What I'm trying to do is look at the vulnerability of areas that need uh, to move into the 21st century instead of just paper. For example, our imaging software to replace existing software and our records were just, you know, we still tracking things in boxes and that disturbs me because if we have a fire, there's a problem. So that was 140,000. And then also, I knew our uh, HR uh, online system was needed very badly because we talked about a couple things. People said, what about, you know, we got a bunch of this and what it does, it, it, it it puts a plan, even playing field with when people put in for positions. We know that it's fair because it's going to be based on the criteria. So we needed some some some, uh, mm -hmm. some checkpoints in our system to make sure that our vulnerabilities go away. And then I visited the coroner's office, looked at her process, looked at some of the things that do. She has an automated uh, just one sheet where she goes in and key in all the information about the I always say patient about the deceased. But did she need a little more? So it can interface with some other things of dealing with, um, what's the record? Is it vital records uh, that's up in uh, yes. CDC? So she also communicates with CDC as well. So it wasn't anything, no pun intended, but I'm just, I'm trying to tighten down those areas so we can tighten up our technology and be able to communicate with just not only in our uh, playing field, but other places as well. So that's what I was thinking about. And I, I didn't think about a budget as yeah, I was thinking. We didn't either in, in the technology committee. We just need to make, I mean, we hold everybody else's feet to the ground. We need to hold her feet, yes. feet to the ground. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I understand. Okay. Um, we'll move on to the next one. Yep. Any other questions before we move forward? 
business items. We have 10 items on the agenda today. <coughs> Tab number six, authorization to accept the Violence Against Women Act, uh, the AWA, competitive grant from Criminal Justice Coordinating Council, CJCC, create a position for domestic violence investigator and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. Hello. Hello, uh, District thank Attorney Ryan Leonard. Yes, ma'am. My name is Ryan Leonard. I'm the acting district attorney here in Douglas County. I come before this body today to ask that you authorize a $50,000 grant through the federal government. Um, Criminal Justice Coordinating Council. Uh, we originally requested from the federal government a, a grant, I believe, sixty-seven to sixty-nine thousand dollars. And the reason we requested that from them is because our intention is to get someone with specialized training. Right now our investigators are general investigators. Uh, they kind of work on the, the entire spectrum of cases that we have in our office. Uh, our intention was to get someone with specialized experience in dealing with uh, victims, uh, crime and, and excuse me, uh, female and uh, child victims of violent crime, uh, which those of you that aren't in law enforcement, some of you in the room are, know that you know, in those situations you, you need a, a kind touch and you need specialized training to be able to communicate with uh, certain types of victims, child victims, uh, women that are in a domestic violent, uh, violence situation relationship. And so it, 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 it requires and needs more uh, background than just if you want to go out and investigate a burglary case, if you want to investigate a forgery case, if you want to investigate an entering auto. Those are cut and dry. Uh, the facts are what the facts are. These cases are somewhat dependent on being able to communicate and build a rapport with your victim. Uh, be able to interview your victim and so uh, long story short I don't want to look a, a gift horse in the mouth we asked for more we got 50 we have worked uh, within our office uh, and worked with Mark Teal to uh, be able to cover that shortfall uh, because once I started looking around to try to see who I could hire for the $50,000 that was, give, was given to us by the federal government we actually couldn't meet our proposed classification um, and advertisement for this position, which is an investigator with minimum of three years of experience. Uh, as far as law enforcement, at least locally, uh, it's my understanding and talking to a couple of people, once you move into a detective or an investigator position, uh, and if you have certain degrees, uh, and certain levels of training, you would have been priced out of our $50,000 grant um, position. And so uh, the, what we're asking for is for it to be funded with money that's in our budget already, that we're going to move uh, another position that is now vacant, uh, and we're going to use that money to fund this, which we see as being more essential. Uh, the other was a part-time um, legal staff assistant or secretary position. We see this position as being much more essential and we think uh, at 50,000 we wouldn't be able to hire a person that would be able to fill this role. So we think we've worked it out and we will be able to have the money available to hire people with a number of years of experience in this field as a criminal investigator or detective and so we would ask that um, this grant be accepted and that a new position uh, called domestic violence investigator uh, be created and uh, as I stated we, we believe that we have the money we do have the money in our budget already um, and so we're not asking the county to make up that that shortfall between the salary of uh, what we were seeking and what we were given from the federal government Okay, any questions from the Board of Commissioners or come in? Commissioner Gaida. Uh, uh, Mr. Ryan, uh, I mean, uh, Leonard. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> we got two last names. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, um, is there any match from the county at all? So there's no impact to the budget at all? No, well, no impact to the budget, but so the grants for 50000 
And, and he's got the money in his budget that he can make up the difference. He can make up the difference. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am, within his budget. Uh, with, with and this, sustain it. Would this be an ongoing grant or just a one year grant? It's my understanding it's ongoing now. Nobody can foresee the future. You know, I can't promise that indefinitely they're going to continue to fund it, but it's my understanding that it will be uh, ongoing. And, and what is the difference that you're going to have to make up? from the grant money? Uh, I believe the the total in counting, uh, including the benefits, is it's 89000 for the position. The, the salary would be funded at sixty nine. Now, if we can hire somebody qualified below sixty nine, we will, obviously. And uh, so it would be everything above 50000 so 39000 yeah, I believe. Somewhere around 40000 Okay. All right. And you're back. Okay. And have a question. Oh. I just have a yeah. finance Still back to question. Holman. With the part-time position that you're making up for that, would that be eliminated? Yeah. <coughs> so yeah. We would be. not seek next year to refund okay. that position. We we're, we're going to try to use, so you know, in, yes. in in analyzing what's more essential to our office, we we determined that this is much more essential and would be a greater return on investment. So yeah, I, I wouldn't then seek to fund that part-time next year. Okay. okay. Thank you. Question. Any other questions from the Board of Commissions? Thank you so much. All right, thank you, ma'am. Uh, okay, tab number seven authorization to renew the contract with Cot Systems Incorporated for services provided for the clerk of Superior Court and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. Superior Court clerk. Good morning. Tammy Howard, good morning. I'm Tammy Howard, the clerk of Superior Court. Mine's pretty simple. Um, Cot Systems is our vendor for our deed and land records that we've had over 30 years. We just have to sign the contract every four years. They are not going up on their monthly maintenance, so everything's pretty much the same. Come on, it's short and sweet. <laughs> any, other, any questions from the Board of Commissioners? The only change, we're, we're going to have one change, and that is they, uh, the, the, the contract mentions Connecticut law. We're going to change that to Georgia law. Georgia. Other than that change, we're fine with it. And I will contact them as soon as I get back to my office to make that change. Okay. All right. Sounds good to us. Thank you so much. Tab number eight, authorization to accept bonds from the technology fund in the amount of $1,459.06 to purchase a laptop for Judge Brian Fortner to utilize for state court accountability court operations. Director Holman. Yes. Um, the technology fund, I believe, is handled within the court office mm -hmm. and um, so it went through the uh, appropriate channels there to get authorization so the check is coming to the county uh, for $1,459.06 as it said for a laptop for Judge uh, Fortner for the State Court Accountability Court Operations and when it's completed um, in New World it will also run through uh, IT to make sure that it meets their requirements as well. Okay, any questions from the board? Commissioner Gardner. Well, he looked like he would. Russ looked like his mouth dropped. She's going to use the board in a second. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh. All right. Thank you. Okay. All right. We're going to move on to tab number nine. Approved updated fund balance policy to include excess fund balance that is committed for capital outlay. Director Coleman. Moving right along. While he's pulling it up, I'll just kind of give you some background. As you know, we had our um, external municipal advisors um, look at our current policies um, to make sure they were on par with what we... Yes. To make sure that uh, they were on par with what they needed to be. Um, also, when we went to New York um, when we to see the rating agencies, um, they were fine with our policies, but there's always room for an improvement. And one thing that they suggested was have um, when your when your fund balance exceeds your policy, which is a good thing, um, to have a policy contained within the fund balance policy to say how you're going to use those funds, to kind of have a a direction or at least a guide uh, to show that. So what we did, <laughs> yeah, I'll be there. 
Y'all see that? Mm -hmm. Okay. I put it on here because it's a lot of percentages of percentages, and I think many of you see it and then show the example will make more sense. Uh, this is what we're suggesting or being recommended to add to our fund balance policy. Uh, for it to say, in order for the county to take steps to fund and build reserves for capital outlay outside of the SPLOS capital outlay, because as you know, that's primarily where we get all of our capital or most of our capital funding. Uh, funding from the general fund should be set aside. Therefore, when the county's general fund, unassigned fund balance exceeds 15%, as you know, we have a 10% minimum, but that's a bare minimum. Um, but we're saying anytime that the unassigned fund balance exceeds 15% of expenditures, 25% of that excess um, could be placed in a committed fund balance for future capital outlay. Also, of the amount that we set aside for future capital outlay, only, not only, but up to 50% of this committed balance can be used on a single capital outlay project unless otherwise approved by the Board of Commissioners. As previously mentioned in this policy, committed fund balance is a portion of a fund balance that includes amounts that can only be used for specific, uh, for specific purposes pursuant to constraints imposed by a formal action of the Board of Commissioners and remain binding unless removed in the same. So what I did is the example here <coughs> is just for basic numbers, our general fund expenditures are in the low 90s, but just for rounding purposes, let's just say our general fund expenditures are 100 million. Our minimum fund balance requirement with our current policy of unassigned is 10%, so that would be $10 million of unassigned fund balance. 15% of that, of course, would be $15 million. Um, so that's just kind of giving you a basic example. So in year one, if our fund balance was $20 million, the amount in excess of the 15% of fund balance, so in excess of the 15 million, since we have 20, is 5 million. So then we would put 25% of this 5 million in a committed fund balance just to set aside for capital projects that may be needed, whether they be transportation, parks and recreation, any infra, uh, IT um, items. Um, so then in year two, let's just say our fund balance is 21 million, or six million amount, uh, six million is the amount in excess of the 15% fund balance. So the 25% committed fund balance would be 1.5. We already have 1.25 in there, so therefore an additional $250,000 would be set aside. And again, we would be able, this would still be within the general fund. It would just make us initially just plan for capital expenditures and put money aside uh, from our current fund balance. So um, this is what we are um, talking about. We talked about it at the last finance committee meeting and uh, just wanted to bring it before y'all to make it official or make any improvements or changes. This is what we're recommending the excess fund balance policy be within our fund balance policy. Thank you, Commissioner Guyer. Any questions? Okay, we have a capital transportation fund, but we utilize some of that to balance the budget. So, uh, are we going to uh, put it in a fund that we cannot use for other things other than capital? It's going to be as committed in the general fund, as committed by y'all's approval and action. The reason that we we were able to use the capital transportation fund balance to fund the 2018 general fund is because y'all took formal action y'all adopted the budget based upon that being a funding source coming into the general fund so what this would do would be you know we have all kinds of different <coughs> fund balance uh, we have unassigned assigned committed okay. this would have a layer of committed fund balance that we would have within the general fund and it would be money set aside and it would only be um, used and set aside and used um, for a specific purpose and it's contingent on the formal action of the board of commissioners so it would be something i could do mark could do we would bring a recommendation probably through a finance committee bring a, a recommendation to the board of commissioners to release that money from committed to apply either to a project or whatever y'all see fit I know when I went through ACCG training when I was elected, um, they recommended three months mm -hmm. um, fund balance. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and then I think the very first meeting that I attended, you, you were recommending the GASPI uh, recommendation of the 10%, which is a lot lower. Uh, it's minimum. That's minimum. what I like to stress. Is ours That's is the just minimum. based on minimum. Um, Believe me, and I've had the conversation with Madam Chair and Vice Chair and, and, and Mark as well. We want to get to the point where we're at 15, 20, at 25 least, percent at least. At least. Yes. Um, but I don't want to set a policy to or recommend a policy. I don't set policy. Recommend a policy um, on something until we know we can get to it and stay and, and it be sustainable. We usually hoover around 10 to 15 percent, probably not even 10, usually 12 to 15 percent. Mm -hmm. We have been as high as 22 to 25 percent. Um, but it's something like with a policy, that's why we say we have a minimum of 10. That's why, in my opinion, I like that we don't even think about setting excess fund balance aside, even 25 percent of it, until we've re even reached the 15 percent. Mm -hmm. Because I want to gradually get us to where maybe we come before y'all as a recommendation and we get to that 15, 20 percent fund balance. Well, several years ago, I think it was a resolution by the board to put 500000 into the capital transportation fund. But see, to me, that should have been dedicated, but it, it's not because uh, we're using it for other purposes. So, um, And then today, this is excess fund balance, and we've used it to fund uh, some budget improvement requests. So, uh, I'd like to see something like this, but I'd like to see you know a very stringent use of it. I guess is uh, what well, I'm committed. recommending that it be used just for capital. Well, just and, I, and I think even an advisement of our municipal advisors, we want to be able to have a guide, a policy as a guide, but you don't want to paint yourself, put yourself in a corner where you know what if we have a recession like we had or what if we have a big flood or yes <laughs> so you, you don't want to do something that you know you're going against your policy that's why we can set this money aside and if something i hope it doesn't but if something just uh, tragedy happens or natural disaster happens or whatever it would still take formal action by the board to yeah. take it out of this committed and put it back in unassigned it wouldn't be something I could arbitrarily do or Mark could arbitrarily do or even the committee if it says formal action by the board. So if we did 15% of the expenditures, uh, that would be what well, <laughs> You're looking at around 13. On our, our current. <coughs> yeah. If you say about a $90 million budget. Comfortable level that we should uh, maintain as our fund balance. I'm sorry to say that. Uh, 13 or 14 million should be the comfortable level that we should maintain in our fund balance. That's 15%. Like I said, you know, if we want to, um, and kind of getting off track with this, but it goes with our fund balance, if we want to get to the point where we're not issuing tax anticipation notes, which that was, that was, that was, we were almost there. We were almost <laughs> there, yes. Then we need to be around the 22 to 25% fund balance. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it just depends on the board at the time what their goal is. You know, some sometimes tax anticipation notes wasn't, a, I don't want to say an issue, but it wasn't a goal to get away from that because it was the understanding of what tax anticipation notes were. But then there were, there was a time where, you know, we didn't want to have any debt, whether it be short-term debt or long-term debt. But so even at the 15% level, we're still not at even two months of reserve. Right. Yeah. Well, very I, close. I, I, very close yeah, to two months. I, I would like to see us uh, be between two and three months. Mm -hmm. like it was originally mm -hmm. talked to us in our meeting. Mm -hmm. So, all right, I yield back. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jennifer. I believe right now your our fund our fund balance is at fourteen point six six, right at fifteen percent. Am I that correct? That is correct. Thank you. Uh, any other questions from the board of commissioners? Okay, let's move forward to the next one. Yes, I, I'd like to just weigh in on that one. Um, just real quick, um, I mean, this this was an important policy, and, and a lot of thought went into it. And I, I want to thank the director, uh, working with our municipal advisors. I mean, this this came out of uh, again last year when we went to Wall Street. Our financial position is is, is pretty strong. It, it's solid for our size. They said, but you can do better, right? Um, our, our municipal advisors said, with, with that comment, let's not 
cap ourselves. Let's just have upside. So this, it, it gives you a minimum threshold. It's great to say that we're rolling with $20, $25 million, guys. That's a lot of cash for our size county. It's nice to say, I'm like, we've had these conversations when, when, when the Google hit, and I'm sitting there with the, the prior chairman of director of finance, so I'm like, that's a lot of cash. You gotta have money with the mission. You cannot stack that type of cash, this moderate size county, um, and not be accountable for anything. Thus, we began to have conversations about what? The animal shelter, right? Thus, the bleak rebuilding. You had to have purpose for that type of cash. I mean, it's great to say that we're not on ta ta tax and taxation notes. And I, I advise, like, look, that's too much cash. Go ahead and pay cash for that animal shelter. Because you, you're stacking too much. And I couldn't sit there and let us, like, the taxpayers, we, we, you, you're talking about raising taxes and we're just sitting there on all this cash? No way. I could not sit there and support it. Now, again, I'm, I'm with the full board of commissioners, but it was one of those, like, so have purpose for it. I have, you know, again, not too often we raised the millage rate like we did. We were able to keep that cash, but then we burnt it down. And this is, you know, again, we've been rolling on about a nickel, 5%. He did a good job of looking at that, that book that gave us. If you really look at what was given to us, it's like, no, that's, that's where we really are. Every now and then it'll float. Every now and then cash will come in, but it ebbs and flows. But you don't want to build anything that's going to keep us at such a, a high number of cash in our pockets. I, we're a not-for-profit. Right? We're not supposed to be stacking cash like that. Right? We're, we're, we're supposed to have sufficient to carry ourselves. But I, I want to make sure that as we, as we really look at this, this is a serious policy. This is a big policy. And it was just one of those where, okay, did you just emotionally take money and, and build that animal shelter? They said it was, they, they, they acknowledged, good decision. But they wanted to make sure that we were thoughtful going forward when we do come in cash because our outlook looked bright. So he says, okay, when your cash come, our challenge is that they want to make sure we have a policy and that we have something that we have to come back before the board. You can't just, in other words, we're going to control ourselves not to just drop five and ten million out of pop without having a policy that's measuring against it. And that's what this was about. So again, we're responding to uh, our current times. Now, we all went through training and stuff, and that's a nice to have. Some counties can handle it, some counties can't. But for us, when somebody's looking at us for, you know, um, their, their opinion really matter, and I appreciate our municipal advisors and sort of, sort of like, don't box yourselves. Mm -hmm. Just make sure that you, the minimum is the minimum, 10% is the minimum, but as far as the upside, give you guys some room, grow toward that, um, as it relates to tax anticipation notes, don't ever say we would never get on that. Again, it ebbs and flows, depends on how much cash you got. Don't, don't make blanket political statements when it comes to money, because you can't control how it comes in. Right, this is not like we can go out, you know, you, you shouldn't, I mean, it's not like a private company and stuff, but we have to be very careful with that. So I wanted to emphasize that, Madam Chair, that this, this wasn't, it's not, it's not a policy that we just need to push through. It's, it's an important policy, right? It, it's one that required a certain amount, like, guys, this is, we put a lot of thought on this. We've been working on this an entire year. When we came back from that plane, it was like, okay, let's get this right, right? Because again, if you look at our outlook, and you look at what's, what's uh, on coming down the books, we're going to be in a different financial position. So it's like, okay, so what are you going to do with the excess and how will you make that decision? That's all. I yield. Okay. Just, just put uh, the, the, uh, the candle on the top of the cake there. Uh, I, I think that the issue really becomes how much cash should a municipality or county or state or whatever hold in reserve or and not return to the citizens in terms of property tax relief or that sort of thing. Right. And it becomes a real, uh, you know, balancing act. Because citizens can look at you and see all, the, all this, this money in there and, and really say, well, that's, why do they have all that money? And they, and they understand, a, you know, a rainy day fund, you know, 10%, 15%, two, two months, three months, six months, whatever. They, they understand that concept. But when, but when citizens see too much money in there, mm -hmm. they want to know why it's not coming back to them. Right. I yield back. All right, we'll move on to tab number 10. We'll move it along, you guys. Uh, yep. Tab number 10, approval to accept the recommendation of the Fire M and EMS Committee to provide the Fire Department with an additional eight positions for manpower on ladder trucks and engine for Station 1, Lithia Springs, and Station 10 downtown, um, downtown to help this, uh, decrease overtime costs. Chief Spencer? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Now, I guess to be... Uh, Politically correct, it needs to be person power 
sure my empire. Sure. <laughs> okay. But uh, staffing. Mm -hmm. Yes. But uh, th this is for uh, at the recommendation uh, of our fire and EMS committee. We met. We talked about this. Uh, and to reduce uh, some of our overtime costs, this would certainly help us. Uh, it's eight additional positions, uh, five of which would go to uh, our ladder trucks, and three would go to engine one, which would be down in Leafless Springs. Okay, any questions or comments from the Board of Commissioners? Commissioner Mulkey. Yes. Uh, we're going to have to follow this closely. I, I support yes, it. I support it. Uh, but when uh, a counterbalance, basically a counterbalance promise is being made, if we do this, then this will happen. We need to make sure this will happen if it is happening you know, in terms of overtime savings and so forth. Yes, sir. Uh, so I yield back. Okay, Commissioner Kager, the chairman I, of the fire and the EMS <laughs> committee. <laughs> uh, the reason this was, uh, kind of came up is because every year the, the chief would add I need additional personnel where well, that would get cut. And it went on for years and years and years, so now we find ourselves short about 20. Uh, well, no, 40. <laughs> about 40 positions. So this is a way of easing back to where we need to be, uh, be uh, because they'll be on the trucks, uh, and uh, this is badly needed. Yes, ma'am. It's going to take us about four months to get everybody trained up to be there, but then we'll, uh, we should see a, a large impact on our overtime. On the overtime. And, and it's, most of it will be uh, offset by the overtime. But Chief, do you have um, trouble recruiting people? Well, uh, it, it's not only us. Uh, there is a recruitment problem, uh, mainly uh, in our EMS division. Uh, and. But we're paying, uh, with what we're paying and, and what some of the private services are paying, uh, I don't know if we'll ever be able to keep up with them. Uh, but we do offer some incentives that, that the private services can't uh, offer, uh, such as if, if you get your basic firefighter training, uh, you can auto automatically become a member of the Georgia Firefighter Pension Fund, uh, which will be an additional you know, pension you'll have when you retire. Mm -hmm. Uh, private EMS can't offer that, so that, that's positive. Uh, so we have uh, we stepped up our recruitment effort, recruitment efforts. Uh, we went to a uh, uh, Fortis uh, a school uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we've got some uh, potential candidates there. Mm -hmm. uh, so in, uh, and you utilize Facebook too, don't you? What we do, what we do utilize all county. social media. Some people like to work in their counties. Right. Yeah. They, they do, and uh, we've been very fortunate. We we've, we've got a uh, we put on two uh, EMT classes in the last two years. Uh -huh. Yeah, been very successful with that. Uh, we've got a paramedic class going on now. Uh, that that uh, we should be getting folks out of that uh, July or August. Uh, that'll help us on. So we're, we're trying every day to, you know, cut back on our overtime uh, and still staff the equipment where it needs to be staffed. Uh, that's something that's important uh, for everybody to understand. Uh, our overtime cost is right up close to me. Uh, yes, ma'am. Last year it was nine hundred thirty-nine thousand. Yeah. So that's what we're. That's where we're hoping a lot of this thing is going. And the cost of these five, these eight. And Eight positions is right around five hundred thousand, and they're supposed mm -hmm. theoretically they they will offset the, yeah. the overtime. All right. Thank you. I get that. Okay. But, but we will definitely uh, keep an eye on your, you know, tracking it mm -hmm. to make sure. Okay. Thank you so much, and uh, Vice Chairman Rock, some yeah, other comment. Uh, yeah, just to piggyback on Mission Mole here and watching this, and, and Chief to your point. Um, but just like we just had a conversation about policy and fund balance and, and managing it, um, we, we add eight more people, whatever the magic number is that, that actually you're able to realize. Um, is there, it, what, will we, what will be the trigger to say that we add eight more people and there's still a million dollars in overtime? Um, I, I get, I, I have no problem with it, and I'm not, I'm not, um, 
challenging the need because we've talked about that and we know there's a fire station that's ultimately going to come and it, it needs to be. But I'm, I'm just making sure that as we <coughs> add personnel, rightfully so, to the fire, that we don't, um, we add 10 to 30 people and you still got a million, million and a half worth of overtime. And I, I guess I'll look to the county administrator to work with you, Chief. You guys will ultimately come back and how to, how we're we going to manage that uh, appropriately. I don't want to get into the details of what you use to sort of manage your, your command. I, I, that, that's not my point. It's just the oversight of it, and i just like to hear how we keep up with that. And I know we look at it in finance um, committee, but it just be thoughtful. That's all. Help us, help us manage that. At least let the board make a decision versus be after the fact when we have to amend the budget to sort of adjust to that. Like that. that, that Chris, you keep up with it. He goes right to payroll. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. That was all. It was a thank you, Chief. We're good. Thanks, sir. Okay. Thank you, sir. We just need to add and amend the budget also on item number 10 at the end of this. Oh, amend the budget as well. Okay. All right. Uh, I would just like to commend um, the chairman of our fire and EMS committee and also, uh, which is uh, Commissioner Guider and uh, Chief Spencer for taking a hard look at this. We talked about that over time, a million dollars mm -hmm. in this. It is probably you could bring in some additional personnel to offset it, and thank you so much, because I'm quite sure that's going to help you in terms of efficiency, and you still have almost 500000 left for overtime if you need to utilize it. So thank you for taking those steps, and thank you, Commissioner Guyton. And I do like to thank our commissioners that are on our hiring committee. Uh, we, we face some uh, tough problems, and we've addressed it. I certainly appreciate their support. Yes. Okay. All right. Let's move on to tab number 11. Uh, approval to accept the recommendation of the Fire e and EMS Committee for the purchase of an additional logo sign for the uh, cost of $1,000 for the rear entrance of the Fire Station 2 in Winston with splash bonds. Uh, Chief Spencer? Yes, ma'am. Uh, as uh, Rich told us earlier in the, the presentation he did, uh, this is the station signage. Uh, for our fire stations that has our uh, new logo on it. Uh, one thing that we didn't figure on when we were determining what our cost was going to be for these uh, signs was uh, DOT did this weird little thing out on Post Road mm -hmm. and make that highway. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, we appreciate what they're doing out there. But however, now the back of our fire station is going to become the front of our fire station. Uh, it's going to be much easier for us to get out on that back side than it is the front side. So we really need to, to label both sides of our station uh, with, with a sign. So this is for an additional sign for station two. Okay. Thank you, so sir. Just, just kidding with you there. Okay. Any questions from the Board of Commissioners? Thank you so much. So you said we'll be, the back side will become the front side. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And, and that sign is at, uh, actually already up on the back side. So this, this sign will be going on the front side. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Tab number 12, authorization to award a contract to Car Carter Watkins Associates for professional architectural services related to the construction of the new senior center <coughs> in Lithia Springs and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. Director Peacock. Yes, ma'am. Uh, we sent out a proposal uh, on November the 22nd uh, for the architecture <laughs> and engineering services for the new senior center. We received uh, nine uh, proposals back in, uh, an evaluation committee uh, consisting of um, uh, folks from the senior center and the Woody Fight Center and myself and others uh, looked at the proposals. They ranged from a low of $100,000 to a high of $298,000. Uh, based on the references and the prior experience from all of the uh, companies and the vendors, we're recommending that the board um, uh, award the contract for this service for these services to Carter Watkins. Uh, Carter Watkins has done the. Uh, has provided services to us in the past. They've done the animal shelter as well as the, uh, uh, the new county annex. Uh, we believe that they have the ability to uh, provide us a good uh, consulting service on the senior center. So uh, we're recommending that, uh, that you award that to them for $159,000. Okay. Any questions from board commissioners or comments? Thank you so much. We'll move on to 
tab number 13. Uh, authorization to award a contract to blank <laughs> for the fiscal year 2018 <laughs> countywide shoulder maintenance uh, project for Douglas County at a total cost of blank, which includes a vertical mowing and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents subject to final review. I don't know what those empty spaces are. <laughs> so can you fill it in? Yes, ma'am, I can. We uh, sent out a bid for the shoulder maintenance. We received three bids back. Uh, ranging from uh, th uh, 256000 up to $307,000 for the uh, three cycles of mowing and for the uh, additional cutting. <coughs> um, this has not been to the Transportation Committee. It's on the agenda, it's on the agenda for tomorrow. tomorrow. Uh, Mr. Teal and uh, Mr. Valentine and myself, we've had lots of conversations about this. Uh, we believe we know what the commission should do, but we do want the, 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 com the uh, Transportation Committee to weigh in and understand the um, issues related to each of these three, uh, awarding <coughs> the contract to either any of the three of these different vendors. So we're gonna let the Transportation Committee have a swing at it and then we'll hopefully bring something back at the uh, meeting tomorrow. tomorrow night. Yes ma'am. Tomorrow evening at six. Tomorrow. Okay. That's the plan. Okay. Okay to remain to be seen. Any questions from the Board of Commission Commissioners right now it's very anonymous, but we'll wait until tomorrow. Any questions from the board? I'll move on to tab number fourteen as we move it right along. Authorization mm -hmm. to use lost funds to purchase two laws of the Parks and Maintenance Division and pick up truck for the Recreation Division at a total of $43,283 as recommended by the Parks and uh, Recreation Oversight Committee. Uh, Director Dukes. Yes, ma'am. We are uh, requesting to purchase two large commercial mowers for our Parks Division, <coughs> uh, keep grass mowed in parks, and one pickup truck for our Recreation Division, Recreation Program Division. And these come as a recommendation from the Parks and Recreation Oversight Committee. Okay. Any questions from the board? All right. We'll move right along to tab number 15, authorization to accept the ACCG Group Health Benefits Program Health Promotion and Wellbeing Grant in the amount of $2,500 and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents and amend the budget. Uh, Director Perry. Yes, Madam Chair. This is just our annual uh, grant that we apply for with ACCG. We have the check in hand and we just want to receive those monies within our budget and continue moving forward with uh, planning health and wellness activities. Okay. Any questions from the Board of Commissioners? Commissioner Mulcair. Is this, a, and this an additional grant? Mm -hmm. Had we received this grant earlier this year? Or? Yeah. So this is the second installment. Part. Yes, sir. Installment. Okay. Yes, I sir. yield back. Okay. Any other questions from the Board? With that being said, we'll move on. You have uh, before you we have the approval of the minutes for tomorrow. I uh, encourage you commissioners to take a look at your expenses and then we'll just uh, discuss those tomorrow mm -hmm. at our board of commissioners meeting. Uh, we have committee updates and reports. Uh, we have from the finance committee, uh, health healthcare uh, fund, three-year plan, Greta fund, deficit in the landfill fund, closure, post-closure. Uh, I believe Commissioner Robinson, Vice Chairman Robinson, you will be giving us a quick update. No, just this is more of a, um, as is uh, our go for practice is to make um, both our fellow commissioners as well as the broad public aware of the things that we're going to be talking about at our next finance committee. Yes. So out of that, we'll have um, some additional information to talk about. We're also going to talk about SPLOS and economic development. Um, there's a component within the SPLOS that um, needs to be, you know, there was 10 million that was set aside, um, 7%, I mean, 7 million and 3 million. And we want to make sure we've got a little bit more insight and that we're tracking against that as well. So, and that, I'll yield on that right now. Okay. Any um, other comments from the Board of Commissioners? Yeah, one more. Okay. Yeah, likewise, we've got a transfer. Uh, the Finance Sorry. Committee is today at 2. That's okay. The Finance Committee is today at 2 p.m. Um, in this room. Tomorrow, we have a Transportation Committee at 2 p.m. in this same room. Um, some of the topics we just talked about are on the agenda. We also have Whitestone uh, that we're going to talk about in um, Navigator Guider assets. Um, uh, of course you can. Please. Uh, absolutely. Sit at the table. Um, we have um, that. Um, some, a couple of things. We are going to talk about Connect Douglas. Douglas Connect. Um, get an update on that um, and other matters that are before us. So, again, FYI, 
Um, and I yield, Madam Chair. All right. Any other comments from the Board of Commissions before I call an executive session? At this time, Board of Commissions, do we need to go into executive session? We do for purposes of litigation, personnel, and real estate. Mm -hmm. It's going to be very lengthy, so make sure you go to the restroom. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. At this time, uh, do we have a motion to go into executive session? Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 I'll see you back in 10 minutes. Yeah. Get your lunch. Yeah. Lunch. Yeah. lunch. Yeah. Take 10 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Bring yeah. Yeah. Yes, I believe it's here. Yeah. Lunch. Yeah. All right. Thank you all. We are back. We on, have um, at Every this month. time, are there any other questions oh. or concerns really? from the Board of Commissioners? No, ma'am. Okay. With that being said, thank you for participating in county government. And this work session is adjourned. All right. Okay. <laughs>